Welcome everybody to the much anticipated Ducks Disrupt Healthcare finale sponsored by Stoller Family Estate. Now, first of all, I want to point out that Paul and I are joining you tonight from virtually an empty classroom, which is certainly not how we started this event. I also want to point out that who could have ever anticipated when we were dreaming about this event that our very first ever healthcare hackathon would be disrupted by a global pandemic. Now, the irony certainly has not been lost on us. But one thing is for certain, COVID-19 has brought into focus our need for compassionate leaders who are invested in their communities and leaders who are able to work on high-performing teams and teams that are nimble and agile and can face uncertainty and that are populated by people who can think outside of the box. And again, it has not been lost on us that those are the exact skills and traits that this type of event can develop. Now I'm going to kick it over to Paul, who's going to tell us a little bit about our journey that led us up to this evening. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. I feel like the Oregon Executive MBA program couldn't be prouder to host an event like this. And it all started with a few students over a year ago now telling us that they would like an opportunity to get to know the Portland region's healthcare professionals and other folks who might be interested in disrupting healthcare in our region. And without a doubt, we were excited to do it. And so here we are 12 months later on Leap Day, basically, that was uh, you know, just over a few months ago from now. Um, we began the Ducks Disrupt Healthcare Boot Camp, sponsored by Stoller Family Estate, as Rachel had mentioned. Um, and we had the fortune of being led by the world-class facilitator and in innovation workshops, Gigi Wong. And so um, with over 40 participants, the boot camp weekend was a huge success, in my humble opinion. And participants pitched their ideas, formed teams, and connected with mentors. We couldn't be happier with the outcome of that initial boot camp weekend. The newly formed teams expected to return one month later um, to pitch their concepts to a panel of judges on March 29th. But of course, as Rachel had mentioned, Ducks Disrupt Healthcare final pitch date was delayed by COVID-19. Additionally, two of our eight teams have dissolved to provide frontline support and assistance to Oregon uh, to curb the spread. So I want to give a quick shout out to Team Health Rabbit and also the team from One Community Health and Hood River and just say how grateful we are to them for initially participating not only with Ducks Disrupt Healthcare, but continuing to participate to assist Oregon in becoming uh, virus free. Now, as Paul mentioned, and as we're all fully aware, on March 16th, COVID-19 really hit the state of Oregon hard. That's when the stay at home orders were issued by the governor. And for the most part, most of us went home and stayed home with the exception of those essential workers who were literally out there saving lives and providing vital support to our community. One thing that I want to point out is that it's not just some of us whose worlds were turned upside down. Our entire world was and still is turned upside down. But here we are three and a half months later and we are delivering the Ducks Disrupt Healthcare event in spite of the disruption. I also want to point out that we honestly never gave up. It wasn't even something that was in our conversations. We didn't even consider the fact that, consider that we may not want to execute on this event. And so while it wasn't something that we could anticipate, the disruption by COVID-19 ended up being something that made this event all the more relevant. So here we are tonight with six teams that are ready to pitch, six teams that have endured a great amount of resiliency in spite of all of the things that they were facing personally and professionally, not the least of which was extending their commitment to one another, which was originally one month to three and a half months. Now, I'm sure none of them were looking at that as, an, as, an, as, an, as something they had to consider when they signed up for this event. But one thing I want to point out is that they have shown resiliency and grit and stamina and determination, and we couldn't be more proud of them and of this event. And we hope that you are as excited as we are. Um, now, I wanted to go directly to the agenda that we have for tonight and share with you what you can expect to come for the next hour or so. So around 6.15, I'm going to introduce Gigi Wong and the Ducks Disrupt judges. We have a keynote speech by Mohan Nair, who is also one of our judges. 
Then around 7 to 8.30, the six teams are going to pitch to the judges' panel. They will convene for 15 minutes to score pitches. Now, during that 15 minutes, we're going to have a photo um, uh, slideshow to show you all pictures from the original event if you'd like to stick around and watch. Otherwise, you can step away from your computers. And around 8.45, we're going to announce the winners. At 9 o'clock, we're going to have a Stoller Family Estate toast and wrap. Now, before I introduce Gigi Wong, I wanted to give a shout out to Buddy Burke. Buddy has been coaching our teams and helping them hone their presentation skills for the past two weeks. Buddy is a professional speaking coach, and I just want to make sure that everyone here thanks him for his generosity of time and of his talent. So let's, let's give it up for, for Buddy. Hey. Hey. Yeah. There we go. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Buddy. Now I'd like to introduce Gigi Wong, who has been the Ducks Disrupt facilitator since day one. Now, this is an overused metaphor, but not in this case. Gigi has been our North Star. You have guided us, shared your wisdom with us, and your incredible sense of humor, and we would not be here today without you. Gigi is an industry fellow and a faculty member of UC Berkeley's Sutarja Center for Entrepreneurship. She was the chair emeritus of VLAB, formerly MIT Stanford Venture Lab. So Gigi, if you'd like to speak to the group and introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am so excited. And seriously, you know, with, you know, with the COVID and the delays and how everyone's life's been disrupted, you know, I was, wasn't sure how you guys will be coming across the finish line, but I am so impressed with all of you and I just can't wait to hear your final pitches. So go Ducks Disrupt Health. Thank you, Gigi. <laughs> Thanks, Gigi. So now I'm gonna introduce our judges. Our first judge that I'm introducing is Holly Burke. Holly is the Vice President and Assistant General Counsel at Kaiser Permanente. She currently manages a large legal team providing support for Kaiser Permanente's operations across the entire United States, including all of their medical device, supply chain, and IT innovation projects and intellectual property protection. Holly also helps lead the national supply chain and enterprise shared services at Kaiser Permanente. A native of California, Holly received her BA from Stanford University and law degree from UC Berkeley. Holly spent many years at Vodafone in San Francisco and London, where she led a team of attorneys supporting international operations and development. Now, when not sheltered in place, Holly and her husband, Buddy, yes, you got that right, Buddy Holly, <laughs> enjoy cycling in exotic destinations and flying in their ultralight airplane. Holly. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here tonight um, to hear all your pitches. I, I shared with a couple of the folks in the Dus Ducks Disrupt program, but back at end of February, beginning of March, I was also participating in an executive MBA program with a healthcare focus at Harvard. And I was with 30 other Kaiser Permanente physicians. And at the end of a long two weeks, we went straight through seven days a week. We would go to the and study and be in our small sections. At the end of the two weeks, our case study was on the Chilean mine rescue. Oh. That was several years ago when these miners got trapped underground. They didn't know how to rescue them. And we're totally tired. I'm in my small section with a bunch of these docs. And we're like, why did they give us this case study? Like, what are we gonna get out of a Chilean mine rescue? Okay, the next day, we were flown back from Harvard to shelter in place and with the pandemic. And one of the docs who was in my small section, he leads our telehealth program. When we left Boston, we were do running about 2000 telehealth visits every week. Now he leads a program at Kaiser Permanente where we just hit a record 45 thousand telehealth visits in one day. So we joke, now we understand why we studied the Chilean mine rescue. Yeah. So one thing I know all of you will get out of this program is that you'll have lifelong friendships and um, you never know where the learnings are gonna be applied that you've um, 
learned in the program. And I look forward to hearing all your pitches. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Holly. Next up is our second judge, Andy Robbins. Andy is the co-founder of Oyster, the Portland-based leadership development company. He is the founding member of Oregon Sports Angels. He is a charter member of TIE Oregon Angels and has a 25 plus year career at Intel. Andy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? And you, Great. And, yes. Yeah, thank you, Rachel, sure. and good evening. I gotta say, it's a pleasure to be with you all. And I do remember that evening, that very exciting evening when we all got together. And I was looking forward to working with you and then obviously things changed a little bit on us. And you know, the, one of the words that I've heard a lot this evening already is disruption. And you know, COVID-19 has been heartbreaking and challenging. It's also been incredibly disruptive. And while that's painful, that can also create the opportunity for innovation. Now, I want to give you an example. Um, I do some work at OHSU, and they've had a goal for the past year to increase digital visits. And it was interesting. In February, I think they did around 34 visits, digitally, despite having a big goal for this. I'm not sure you could guess how many they did in March, but as they say, you know, uh, when you have challenging constraints, we have to find a way to make it work. And what's interesting is they were able to actually do 1,700 digital visits. So it just illustrates that when we have a challenge and we have some constraints, it can really bring out the best of us and create some amazing results. So I'm really excited uh, about what you're gonna share this evening. And I hope you're taking advantage of challenging the way we've been working and looking forward to how we might be able to work more effectively in the future. One thing that uh, sort of comes to mind is it's also very easy for us to say right now, well, that was only possible because of COVID-19. I encourage you coming away from this, not only to challenge now, but going forward to ask yourself, what would have to happen for us to continue this and really make something great come out of the challenges that we face? So I'm looking forward again to hearing what you're gonna share with us and, and kudos to all of you for navigating the challenges that have been thrown up in your way. Awesome. Thank you, Andy. Our third judge for this evening is Alan Yordi. And first of all, I wanna mention that Alan is alumnus of the Oregon Executive MBA program. Um, he has 40 years in healthcare. He has been on two startup company boards. He an was an advisor to an early stage healthcare ancillary optimization company. That is a mouthful. And he is a fellow of both American College of Healthcare Execs and the National Association of Corporate Directors. So welcome, Alan. Uh, thanks, Rachel. My 97-year-old uh, mother would be proud of that introduction. Uh, <laughs> who? And by the way, she's been locked down for uh, the better part of two and a half, three months now and is looking forward to the day that she can uh, get out and smell the roses. So uh, it's been a fascinating few months here. And both of the startups where I serve on the board uh, one of which grew out of this program actually several years ago called Fleet Nurse, is thriving in this environment. Uh, there is such a demand for temporary nurse staffing and other staffing, and that uh, little company is doing remarkably well, going through its normal growing challenges, but uh, was in the right place at the right time. Uh, the, needless to say, the healthcare industry generally has been devastated by COVID. Uh, everyone prepared by uh, locking down and eliminating electives and uh, getting ready for the surge, holding special units for the surge of COVID patients, and except for a very few isolated places, the surge never happened, thankfully. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now uh, the industry is in a recovery mode, and there is a lot of opportunity for innovation. We will not go back to the day of having only uh, clinic visits face-to-face. A lot of systems are 
planning for 15 to 25 percent of their visit, visits being virtual. Mm -hmm. And certainly with patient with comorbid conditions, uh, virtual visits are preferred and ideal. So uh, we're seeing a lot of change. I'm still very much involved in uh, supporting operational optimization in healthcare. Uh, there's a lot of innovation, some of which will succeed, some of which will uh, not. But this is a great time and a great opportunity to test a lot of ideas and new thinking in the way we deliver healthcare. So great to be back on what is almost at least the, it's my 23rd anniversary of graduating from this program. Nice, nice. Thank you so much, Alan. And boy, what an honor to have such a great caliber of judges joining us this evening. Now our final judge and keynote speaker is Mohan Nair. Mohan is the Senior Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer at Cambia Health Solutions. In fact, he is the longest standing Chief Innovation Officer in the nation. He is a lecturer at the University of Oregon and happens to teach an elective for the Oregon Executive MBA, which is our top rated elective. He is the author of three books on strategy in measurement and business transformation and cause. He founded five corporate startups at Cambia and prior to Cambia ran two startups both with positive exits. Mohan? Thank you, thank you, Rachel. And thank you all for, uh, for joining us today and, and good luck to all the presenters and the teams as we go through this uh, wonderful evening um, and a beautiful evening it is. Um, you know, Duck Disrupt was a conceived idea of a few students and great leaders like Rachel and other team members and I must commend them for having the courage to put together a program that allows voices to be heard. And we live in a time, as you know, a pandemic was the worst thing we thought would happen, but it became worse and worse and has not recovered yet. But along with it came environmentally oriented crises, like when you get stuck at home and you are addicted to a drug, your mental health challenges take over, if you have a family that is difficult to live with, challenges with the family take over, your personal isolation and physical isolation creates new crises within your life. And along that crisis comes to us a crisis of morality with respect to the African American brothers and sisters we now uh, engage in trying to help. The story of all of these pieces put together cannot be reduced to just telehealth visits. It has to be increased to understand that our calling is broader and much wider than what I think natural systems allow us to look at. They all seem unrelated. They seem like they're piling on, but all of this is about inequity. Not just what we're facing today, not the marches that are going on in downtown, the inequity, the historic inequity we see in the healthcare system that implicates both mental, physical, and emotional, as well as spiritual health in our collective community. We figured out that one person's um, cough becomes another person's breath. And we've seen the connectivity between the airs that we all stand. We are standing apart now. I mean, everyone is standing apart. That, that touch is more important than tech. That tech can allow for some degree of effort like we're doing now, but we yearn to be next to each other and engage in society and that we need help in understanding how to cope with this. Now, one of the most um, confused groups in our society is our pets. I must tell you, I mean, they are really confused because first of all, they didn't know you liked them that much that you'd stay home. <laughs> Second of all, you're standing six way away from your friends. So they're confused. They keep looking at you like, let me go. I wanna go enjoy my my communication, or the cats are like, I didn't really like you that much. Um, everything is six feet apart. So they're upset, but they're also appreciative of what's going on. If you actually look at your pet, you will realize that your pet is giving you love and giving you empathy, knowing that something's not right. Now I've lost my pet. I lost my pet many years ago, my poor little dog. Uh, and I still miss her today and wish she was here with me. So one person's confusion is another person's opportunity to serve, which brings us to you. As entrepreneurs in the healthcare space, I battled myself over what to tell great entrepreneurs 
who pretty much know how to run companies, build companies. You all have your two by two matrices. You know that it's a J curve. You understand that you have to have this much revenue in five years. And if you don't just pretend like you do, you get that market opportunity and angle of incidence. And you understand what it's like to propose an idea so much so that you might not even believe it yourself, but you want to convince others. The process of taking an idea to a narrative is worth considering before you speak. Because I've had the pleasure of working inside large companies and creating companies within them, as well as emerging startups. Both have different, uh, different mannerisms, both have different approaches, but they all have a set of five elements that I've used in my innovation team that I'd like to share with you that might help you not change your presentation on the fly, which I hope you don't, but really uh, change your thinking in terms of how you wanna grow as an entrepreneur or a corporate entrepreneur, whose job in the future is at its beck and call right now. We need you to do things that can help society using the powers that you have gained through learning. First of all, most entrepreneurial entity, entities start with investigating a market. They start with investigating it in the classical sense. So you see the slide decks that say, you know, we have done massive investigations. We have looked at all the documentation and we have discovered that people are getting older every year. And you think, uh, did you actually think that we didn't know that? But that's how it is. You start with the basics and then you work towards your insightful, powerful uh, crescendo. Let me forward uh, another thought. Start with the consideration of what inspires you. And what inspires you, if it's all about you, might be a problem. But if it is about others, if it's about injustice, if it's about discongruence or incongruence, or a mismatch of cause and purpose, or someone unfairly being understudied over others. Example, Harvard Business Review published articles that talked about how African-American doctors who treated African-American males had better outcomes. 19% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, 8% reduction in life expectant expectancy. Think about that and wonder why we, don't, we never had considerations of linking physicians and patients who understood each other better, not necessarily based on race, but in terms of a match. Science Magazine talks about racial bias. And in that bias, they discover that the health of the population is reduced significantly because of racial bias over black patients and that they receive half the extra care that they need based on the algorithms of bias we run within our own system. So if you're lacking inspiration, uh, look around you. They are all over. They are flooding the market with choices for you. So start with that. Consider being a former recovering marketer, there are five eyes, so be careful. There are four more eyes coming. The second I is investigation. And I just belittled it as the way to start. I didn't mean to. What I meant is you have to power yourself with empirical and theoretical and practical and symbolic value. But you have to understand, if you could, the difference between eyesight, which is seeing what the market is, foresight, which is seeing where the market might go, and insight, which is seeing why you can make a difference in the eyes of customers who might buy. That eyesight is knowing that coffee and couches are great things for, for, uh, for Starbucks. The foresight saying, you know what, retail is going to take a different form and that even though three and a half cups of coffee was sold at the time when, when uh, Howard Schultz pushed forward the concept, he still conquered a new market because people lacked the insight to understand that people needed society. They missed each other and that they wanted to gather in a gathering place and wanted a third place. Hence the eyesight, foresight, insight. Once you've got the inspiration and you have the investigation and you find the insight and the right angle of incidents you wanna take your company or your story, a great deal of ins uh, inspiration needs to be targeted towards isolating yourself, quietening your mind and quietening all the noise. If you get up every morning and look at the web and see all the news that hits you, noise will, will, will not be able to come close to the signals because noise has, is designed to create noise. What a great concept. Uh, noise is designed to create noise over the signal. 
what are the signals that you want to isolate in your business model that creates a recipe that delivers value and meaning to others so much that they're willing to pay you their hard earned dollars from the dining table of their home. After the three eyes of inspiration, investigation, isolation and quietening your mind, quietening the story, then comes incubation where you have the concept, you build the prototype, you test it, test it, test it, change it and test it. Understand that the word pivot is a very common term in entrepreneurship. It, it's used in two ways. One is when you discover new things, you pivot to adjust and you become agile. Other ways is you spend a lot of money, money and then you want to tell your investors that you need to pivot so you can get the next money and you keep pivoting. And after a while you pivot so many times, you're staring at your own backside. And that is the failure points of a lot of companies that throw mo good money against bad money. And don't be one of those companies. Incubate, test, understand, and be your worst advocate, not your best. Challenge your own ideas. Kill it before someone else does. And your team and your leadership team should understand how to always question the ultimate premise and go back to inspiration and come back down to investigation and not make it a serial process. And when all of this is done and you are still in the tornado, how do you light the fire? How do you light the music? Light the music, get it back there, light the music. How do you light the music and unleash yourself? Unleash yourself and unleash the team and go to market and, and express your idea uh, to the first customer and the first dollar. That is a skill. As I look at you today as a judge, I will look at all five of these. I will try to understand the meaning behind the meaning and the story behind the story. Now, what's so different about healthcare? Well, healthcare is personal. It's complicated. It's regulated. Its actors are sometimes open to new ideas like they are now, desperately open to new ideas because their business models are failing. But they weren't open to ideas before the business models were failing. They were. They were happy with what they have in general. There were very few, but very caring leaders who said, I know the future has to change because we want to change it because injustice exists and we need to drive that injustice to the right place. So in launching companies, I know one set of things I'd ask you to understand. It doesn't have to be expensive. Your idea is good, but there are many others like it. So your team makes a difference in making that idea fit the eyes, I-5s that I mentioned. Your sponsors are very important, the people who really care about you, not to get their stock from you or not to have a title from you, but people who are trying to make you undeniably powerful. They always counsel you not to sell, but to ask the reasons why you exist, that selling comes from passion, not from skill. And you can fake authenticity only so far because you can't fake it for long. So discovering yourself, and what you really want to do is what makes you the entrepreneur you deserve to be. And always remember, a fool with a tool is still a fool. And it's with a foolish tool now because it can cause a lot of damage. So how do you not be that fool? How do you not be the, the star of your own movie uh, when only one person's watching? Get yourself smart. Please be humble about what you don't know and what you know. Realize that you're as dumb as everybody else. And that being smart means you can act, you can hope, and you can take that hope into strong action and watch the structural changes that are happening around you. Don't take advantage, but give advantage. And above all, change your language. Move from words like kill to heal, from weaponize to enable, from dominate to accumulate for others. Change the language in your mind and change the language in our community. Most of all, today, just have a lot of fun. You know, uh, we'll enjoy watching you enjoy yourself. If you're suffering, we'll enjoy watching you suffering. That's not happy for me. So go with your flow and use the sense of being that you have and ju the journey that you want to create for yourself and start the narrative today as an entrepreneur, which you've always been. You just haven't brought it out yet in front of us. So with that, I wish you only the best. I wish you the best of all the best. And I wish us a good evening today that I hope we can celebrate at the end of it.
Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Mohan. Right. Oh, Mohan. Mohan. That was yeah. amazing. Amazing. Mohan, you set the bar very high, I have to tell you. I mean, I don't know how anybody can outperform a keynote speech like that, but I am confident that our teams are going to wow us with their pitches. But my big question for you, Mohan, is when am I going to get your audiobook and your podcast? Because I want to subscribe and listen to both. That was very inspiring. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't deserve that. But, you know, <laughs> if I can make that, if I can get time to do that, I would be very proud of myself, too. But I'm losing my hair, so it's got to be an audiobook. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. So now, you. without any further ado, on to the main event. Um, so we're going to bring up the order of the teams that are going to be pitching tonight. So starting with Team Nevap, we'll, there, we'll then go into Casey, Team Epion, Edge, Trailblazers, and Sensible. So Team Nevap, are you ready? Are you ready to present? Yes, we are. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Can, you, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. So, hello. I hope everybody is having a safe, uh, safe time at home. And thank you so much for letting us pitch. Uh, we are Neva, and we care about the sickest COVID-19 patients, namely those in the ICU. My name is Dr. Benjamin Wang, and I will be leading, leading the pitch tonight. So this is our team. Mark is a critical care anesthesiologist who has been taking care of COVID patients on the front lines for the last three months. I am a, also a physician and a medical device entrepreneur. Um, Madeline is an experienced design and marketing expert, and Amy is our dedicated business strategist. So the problem with COVID-19 is that the people who suffer the most are the people on mechanical ventilation. Once put on a breathing machine, many of them will get a bacterial pneumonia. This is almost always a big problem and almost always fatal. And what's worse is they'll suffer alone on a breathing machine for at least an additional week. This also limits the amount of um, ICU beds and ventilators that we have. And all this is coming at a time when Oregon is seeing a 175% surge in hospitalizations and the number of beds has not changed. This happens because of the plastic breathing tube. It tracks bacteria from the mouth and into the nose and, and into the lungs. And this is an actual photo of a breathing tube taken from a COVID patient. You see that gray gunk? That gray gunk prevents the air from getting into the patient's lungs, but also grows an enormous amount of bacteria that ends up being fatal for many patients. Our team has created a significantly more effective breathing tube, one that applies a vacuum to remove bacteria and prevent cases of bacterial pneumonia. Now this has some very important added benefits such as reducing other infections, um, reducing the amount of respiratory care labor that's needed, getting people off the breathing machine as soon as possible and ultimately saving lives. Now, this is not a new concept because there's been other competition around for the last 10 years and these tubes are widely used. But when we asked a group of researchers at UCSF to study them in a tissue model where we could, we could set the stage for challenging the device, this is what they found. The, the NEVAP tube re removed 10 to 15 times more fluid and bacteria than the nearest um, market leader. So what does this mean in, in the long run? Well, we're, we're focused right now on saving COVID patients today, but our breathing tube could also be used to save other patients in the future. Patients in the operating room and other places where they're mechanically ventilated. Patients all over the world where they have a high risk of getting a, a, a pneumonia due to the breathing tube. And ultimately every patient that is put on mechanical ventilation could benefit from one of our tubes. Now, we've been selling the tube for uh, um, a number of months now, and what we have found is we need to 
find key opinion leaders in, in the sales process, and they're able to actually pull the device in, in once they've, they've vetted the device. To date, our tube has been FDA cleared and also approved in, in Europe. Uh, we have issued patents. In Oregon, we've piloted the tube at a number of hospital systems, and we are beginning to study the device with Western University of Los Angeles. Beyond Oregon, the tube is being introduced at major university medical centers in other countries, and also large hospital chains are starting to take a look. We have a clear plan to put the tube into more hospitals. We are manufacturing the tube at scale. And in the last two months, we've signed up seven additional distributing partners. When Mexico reached out to us for help, we responded by donating 10,000 tubes to municipalities. What we're asking of you today is to keep us in mind and to provide some introductions so that we can continue to benefit the sickest and most vulnerable population that our healthcare system serves. Thank you very much. Wow, good job. Good job, Ben. Thank you. So now you have uh, seven minutes of judge feedback. Yes. Okay. Judges. Yeah, Benjamin, I, I'll, I'll start. Really great job. I mean, your presentation was extremely clear. And I got to be honest, only having four minutes to present, I wasn't sure you could get through everything. And you did an amazing job of that. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm curious, you know, in the medical industry, it can be really, really hard to displace uh, existing suppliers. Have you had any experiences where you've been able to actually replace an incumbent? And if not, what do you think it will take to be able to do that? So um, we have been able to replace a number of the incumbents. Um, we've encountered two of them before, the Medtronic device and the um, Avanos Kimberly Clark device. We've been able to displace them um, but it's been tough because as a small company, we don't have existing relationships with large medical centers. Um, we don't have, we're not on any contracts. Um, you know, we're not part of any kind of um, bundled, you know. So for us, it really takes a lot of, um, a lot of work. And to be honest, we've had trouble getting into some places because if, um, if we're not on the contract, many places just won't look at us. So it is definitely an, an issue. But the key with our devices, it really only takes a handful of devices for people to really see our tube work significantly better than the other, other device. And once they try it, and the first time they get you know, half a liter out of a patient, it's usually enough to, enough to convince them they can't go back. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and kudos to you for recognizing that challenge of winning over the the big suppliers. Thank you. Thank you. Benjamin, uh, I, I love your, the, the, the story, the narrative, the angle of incidence, the need, the, the, the recognition and the experience you and others and your team are showing in understanding the customer's real, real uh, adventure in this process and how you want to be able to help them get over this problem. Uh, how do you know you're a company and not a product? Well, we're still figuring figuring that out. Um, there are other devices that we would like to develop in this space. Some some patients who are put on mechanical ventilation, they have um, a, a tracheostomy tube put in place. That's basically a different material breathing tube than at a different angle. And our technology would basically work for those um, those uh, patients also. It just it takes time and money to to also develop that. Yeah, very nice. And what what do you think, if you were, what would your best dream be? Uh, let's say today there's somebody in the audience who wants to give you a gift besides a bottle of wine. Um, what would that be for your team? Uh, an introduction to somebody um, at a large hospital center or a hos large hospital chain who would be willing to put it into patients today so that they can see that it, it will benefit them. That would be the best thing. That would be the best thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, Ben, this is Alan. And uh, just a couple of uh, thoughts about 
your presentation. First of all, I, I think you started right on track, believing that it is a few key players in a few key institutions that will be the keys to success. Uh, you know, breaking into the GPO or contract market is a hard, hard deal, but one of the groups who I'm serving on uh, the board is also providing a, a different product in a different space. But what we've learned is it's all about, in this case, the NICU doc and the NICU nurse. In your case, it's going to be about, you know, that pulmonologist, that, that uh, critical care physician that runs the ICU. And, and introductions to a few of those people uh, where you gain ground is really, uh, uh, I think your, your opportunity, you're absolutely right to spend all your time and focus there. So this is clinician to clinician selling in some respects, uh, sure. or certainly knowledgeable sales leaders to clinician selling. Uh, and you've got to be in the places where they are. So uh, uh, kudos there. Uh, it does sound like you built a better mousetrap. And yeah. <laughs> uh, given the data you've got, you've got a very compelling story. And so um, I, I guess the caution always is you want to go faster than the market will go. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this other company that, that I've been with is in the human donor milk business. And it's been in the business for three years. And we really thought that things were going to end up being on fire for a whole lot of reasons. It was a better mousetrap. It was a natural and you know everybody believed but the diffusion process just takes a while. So uh, be patient. Alan, if, I, if, if you can connect with me, I actually know the world's foremost breastfeeding um, expert. So I would love to introduce you to her. She's a very nice lady at UC Davis. Great. And I, uh, <laughs> I, I also uh, serve on the board of, of a health system and, and know, have a connection to a number of health leaders. So uh, let's, let's do let's make a point to connect <laughs> after this for sure. Sounds good. Yeah. Good, thanks. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Wang, it's Holly. Hi, Holly. That, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great, yeah. Couple questions. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just in terms of, have you thought about um, possibly, you know, doing a white label product on it and having it go through a med surge distributor like an Owens and Minor or Cardinal Health, that might be, because, you know, you're right. It's hard for a big health system like a Kaiser Permanente to buy a single tube from one company, right? So thinking about how can you grow my company and unless you want to sell, of course, how can I grow my company and enter the market? Um, absolutely, absolutely. One of the distribution partners that we were talking that we were talking to is actually asking exactly can they white label this and put their <laughs> name on it? Right. And, yes. and um the problem is they're probably not big enough to do, you know, they have a nationwide reach and they have contacts, but I'm not sure there's, they're specifically the best partner and they want an exclusive on it yeah, too. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's a push and pull. Um, yeah. But I will tell you, there is a lot of pull from, from the other side. Um, Kaiser Vacaville, we have some very good um, champions over there and they would really like to trial our, our device because they're very yeah. unhappy with what they do. Yeah. I know some of those folks. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, I look forward to seeing your contract come through. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's give it up again for Team Nevac. Good job, Ben. Way to go. Way to go. Yay. Next up is Team Casey. Are you ready to go? Yes, we are ready. The year was 2020 and all through the land, a pandemic was raging. Now physicians were starting to conduct their office visits via telehealth, a relatively new platform that few had used and even fewer knew how to use effectively. Now patient experience and healthcare was already low. Adding in this new care delivery system was a recipe for disaster. The playing field is leveled. It is now time to stand out. Meet Casey a new provider in experience management software and analytics to help build the future of telehealth. Now, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? I always wanted the ability to read people's minds. 
That way I would know exactly how I was affecting them and what I could do differently in the future to have a more positive experience. Think of Casey almost like a mind reader. It is able to tell us exactly what patients are thinking and feeling through these four points. Emotion analysis, spoken word sentiment, body language analysis, and also the environmental factors. Casey is a two-way analysis for cause and effect correlation between the physician and the patient. For example, at the end of the month, the physician might get a report saying that maybe they should use the word treatment instead of the word medicine, because for their patients, treatment gives a more neutral response, while medicine might be a more fearful response. Now, Casey is an add-on software. It uses machine learning and AI, and it can utilize existing APIs. And it aggregates patient data to preserve privacy. So why does this even matter? Well, if you have better patient experience, you're gonna have more patients. Plus, the telehealth training for physicians is lacking right now, and Casey can help. And we're just beginning to uncover the potential for what telehealth data can tell us. Let's look at how it is versus how it could be. With current patient experience software, there's a lot of pain points. You're getting the patient's opinion only at post-visit. Patients might hide their true feelings, their survey fatigue, low response rates, and not a lot of, lot of training direction for physicians. But if we add in Casey, it helps because we're measuring actual behavior and that cause and effect between the doctor and the patient. Less surveys are needed and targeted physician training is possible. Now, when we measure the telehealth patient journey, we have our pre-visit analytics for websites and mobile apps. We have our post-visit analytics, some of these which you may recognize. But what's the missing piece? The interaction analytics between the doctor and the patient. This is where Casey fits. So who is the customer for Casey? It is actually the patient experience directors or telehealth directors in current healthcare systems or the uh, telehealth startups uh, that will most definitely come into this space. So whether we talk to the healthcare providers or we see the news, you know, that we could top a billion vis visits coming this, uh, this year, it, it's inevitable that uh, there's a lot of demand, but also that uh, the healthcare providers are trying to figure out how to deliver this in a great way. So when we talk about our industry, customer experience industry is expected to grow 18.5% year over year. And within telehealth, it's expected to grow 2.4%, and that's before COVID. And as many of you have said, we're seeing exponential growth here, and we see a lot of value for what Casey can provide. The business model is a B2B software and data as a service. Uh, primarily focusing on a core product of Casey Analytics, as well as research and consulting that will be uh, priced at a per project basis. So when we talk about bringing uh, Casey to market, we look at three horizons. In the first year, it's starting to build out the product, as well as start the consulting business to learn more. And then we're going to look to launch the product in phase two. And then in horizon three, we would look to expand the market or sell the business if the market looks right. So when we talk about market size, we started looking at all physician visits annually. Uh, we then narrowed down to looking at projected healthcare visits and telehealth. And then for the launch of KC, we're focusing on Oregon and Washington telehealth visits and primary care. And we expect that market to be somewhere around 18.6 million. So when we talk about going to market, we're gonna really wanna leverage the referrals from those early adopters uh, and partners that work with us, as well as education through trade publications and then hiring a sales force to educate uh, the telehealth professionals out there in the market. So when we did multiple different financial projections, we know it's gonna take an initial investment up front, but we really think this could be a multi-million dollar company looking out into the future with over a million dollars a year, but that's before and, and only looking at a small market and before COVID uh, has changed the trajectory. So we have a fantastic team uh, with experience in digital leadership or digital delivery, um, marketing, and in addition to healthcare and finance. However, we know we're missing a CTO and that will be an acquisition that we need to make. So our ask is really, we need to understand a partner who could help us build this uh, and partner with us on the build for R&D and then to make sure that we're HIPAA compliant because we know there's gonna be uh, some challenges there and that's why we're looking to aggregate the data and, and take away the privacy pieces and then finding a chief technology officer to help uh, deliver the technology that we're gonna do. So the year's 2020, telehealth is the future. A lot of people are talking about it. Invest in Casey and let us help deliver it.
Great job. All right. So now for your feedback. Great job. So judges. Um, Holly, do you want to start first? Sure. Can you just <clears throat> maybe it was it was fast for me. So can you just walk me through like a what what kind of feedback does the provider get the feedback or you know how does how does give me a day in the life my patient comes she's there I'm here how how does it work? You want me to take this, Robbie? <laughs> I can take it if you want. Okay, so, go for it. Yeah, so really, as we look at the kind of the pre and post analytics, we're not really measuring the behavior that's really happening. And it was never really possible before uh, we had the ability to have video of what's going on in those interactions. So it introduces a whole new opportunity to understand, um, you know, as we talked to one healthcare provider, they were talking about wanting to understand background noise and what's going on in that patient environment to understand what doctors may face a challenge on. So understanding, you know, background noise, are there people around? Um, but then also, are there trigger words that are kicking into things that, you know, I think in the pre-discussion, there was a lot of discussion around um, it's complex in healthcare and there's a lot of things going on. So it could be looking at phrasing, it could be looking at uh, words that are being used. Um, and, you know, when you're looking at how, what people are saying they believe in the experience, we believe we can capture what they're really doing in that experience to be able to provide. Um, and why we can do it with the with the doctors, we'd also be able to look at doing it with uh, other video interactions that they have along the whole journey map. But physicians are the ones where that's at, but we expect that that video would be into, say, billing or in, we could visually read what emotion is going on with those consumers to try and figure out what those triggers are to be correcting is, is telehealth is built out further. And so some sort of report is provided post, at some point there's some report that's provided to the provider. Yes, it would be an <laughs> analytics dashboard and a report, exactly. Okay, thank you. So could I follow up Holly's uh, question because uh, I, I think it was a good start uh, to the, the question of the story and the tool. So let me try to recite it back and see if I'm close. Uh, you're recording or documenting visits using video. There's either some artificial intelligence or algorithm that's used. It's not just sort of human uh, analysis of videos, correct? Uh, that then is aggregates data, which you can provide back to the provider. Uh, is that about right in terms of what this tool does? Yes, it would be like that. And just to make the point, nothing is actually being recorded. Like there is not a video recording being kept or an audio recording being kept. Um, all of the patient data is aggregated and anonymous. So whatever, however the development, which we should also add a lot of this already exists in other industries. For example, in um, video interviewing scenarios, this is already being used on facial analysis to see, you know, if a candidate is going to be working for this company well or not. So that's where we're going with this. So, so facial analysis may be at the core of this product. Is that right? And also audio. So it could be used for telehealth that is just audio with no video as well. Got yeah, it. so if you, if you think about it, we're trying to catch the uh, question response. So as a patient says something or a doctor says something, we can correlate how the emotions are acting between doctor and patient in both two way. And that's one of the things that we, we think is, is not really being done out there in any way, shape or form today. And when do you believe you're going to have an alpha product in the field or do you already? So the technology exists. We just need developers to actually use the existing APIs and we need some machine learning. So we need, we need the partner that can help provide us with doctors and patients that are willing to actually be the first test subject so that we can get that machine learning going. Um, and that's also why we need our CTO to help <laughs> give us that expert opinion on how long it will take. Yeah, so we we pursued talking to companies. We know the we know the technology exists. We'd have to find a partner that'd be willing to to take their technology to mass market. Good, thanks. That really helps. Andy, do you have any feedback? 
Yeah, I've got uh, some questions. So first of all, thank you. I mean, it's uh, it's certainly a very innovative solution. Um, and I like how you're applying something from another industry. Um, I'm curious, obviously adoption is, is key here and you need to create pool for adoption. Often with new technologies, it can be very daunting um, and there can be hesitation. We only change when we see the changes in our interests. How do you convince both patients and physicians to go down this path? How do you give them that compelling reason to want to, to use this? I think for physicians, one of the things we've heard a lot is that there's not a good comprehensive way to train physicians on how to do telehealth effectively. So training, I think it would be our foothold into the door for physicians, especially when they see a report saying, like my example said, hey, don't use the word medicine because all your patients are getting a fearful response from you. Um, use treatment instead. Um, so that's kind of how we're hoping that we're going to break into the market, at least with physicians. Um, for patients, this would be something that obviously in the first few, um, throughout the development, they would need to give us permission to access their data so we could set it up. And they're already giving us permission to do the telehealth as it is for the initial calls. So we're hoping that by knowing that they're contributing to a better patient experience, that they will want to let us do this sort of analysis. Got it. And I'm really glad to hear you talking about training because with training, you've got less challenges and you're in more of a, let's say an artificial environment. And I, I know, you know, quite a number of physicians where they're brilliant physicians, yet the bedside manner is maybe not the best. So I can see, uh, an application of that beyond tele, telehealth as well. So I think that could be really valuable for you. Thank you. I think Hi, you Mohan. have a good idea. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, Mohan. <laughs> you're moving around on my screen. <laughs> Am I? Am I moving yeah. around? Yeah. All right. so, Don't want to make you nauseous. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think it's a really interesting idea to, to help physicians and patients engage remotely this way uh, because I think it's new for everyone except you know when you talk to your grandmother and Facebook it seems fine but when you're speaking to a physician there's language and there's there's an interaction that's very different uh, my my concern with this is that um, first of all you don't have a technologist to give you the basis for whether this can work or not and you need to get that really down pat uh, from my experience of visual uh, and sentiment analysis, even with Google uh, sentiment analysis, which is underway right now, there's limitations. There, and those limitations could actually be very challenging for a patient relationship with a physician. I would ask you to really consider as you mature this, to check on the tech, to make sure that it really has a, uh, what the boundary conditions are for uh, human to human interaction and the assessments of technology on how humans are relating to each other. But I would ask you to take a different stance. I, would, I don't wanna infect the experiment, but I am suggesting that the cultural biases within patient and physician could be an area that is really waiting for, for someone to involve themselves in. Um, eye contact in certain cultures is not considered good. So when you have telehealth, uh, communication between physician and patient, the machine could read it to be not interested or really not telling the truth, et cetera, et cetera. So why don't you dig in as you have time on what are the cultural implications uh, towards multimodal ways in which you can meet with the patient? Uh, and it does, does not even have to be visual. It could be chat too, because chat analysis exists right now. Uh, so think about that, because I think that you have something there but you need to create a little bit more energy that allows you to get into the mindset of people who are relatively insecure, not just about telehealth, but now of the diversity expectations within telehealth. Think about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think Great we are job. moving on, right? Great <laughs> job, moving on. So next up is Team Ethione.
Okay, hello everyone. So uh, we are Epion. My name is Jason Weiss. Uh, I'm here with Rohan Wanchu, uh, Lube Nikon, and Thomas O'Toole. Uh, we're so excited to be here at Ducks Disrupt Healthcare and share our AI-enabled uh, intuitive and automated remote health monitoring system. So we are fourth year med students at OHSU uh, who will have our own patients next year. And we found that accessing medical care and managing chronic diseases can be difficult for them. So our goal in developing Epion uh, is to make their lives easier. Uh, I want you to raise your hand if you know anyone with high blood pressure or heart failure. All right, I'm seeing plenty of hands and that's because three out of five Americans live with a chronic condition. Uh, a lot of these patients live in rural areas, making monitor monitoring these diseases difficult. So let's talk about monitoring. With chronic conditions, uh, management is all about tracking. For those of you who didn't know anyone with a chronic condition, you know one now, Gigi. Uh, when she was diagnosed in 2017 with high blood pressure, she made it one week of monitoring her blood pressure on pen and paper, which is the way most patients manage these today. It's grossly outdated and uh, Rohan is gonna show you how we're gonna change that. Yeah, so we're gonna use Epion branded pre-configured third-party devices that connect seamlessly to our app via Bluetooth. Uh, these devices monitor things like blood pressure and weight. Uh, that information is uploaded to our cloud storage servers, uh, which can then be made available for electronic health record systems and also processed through our pre-trained machine learning model to look for concerning trends and selectively alerts the provider if it finds any red flags. Now, Lubna will talk about how this works in the real world. So we want to make this process as easy as one, two, three. Step one, patients come in for a regular primary care visit with their providers. For those who are diagnosed with either hypertension or heart failures, or heart failure, uh, providers can help set up an Epion account for these patients in, in the setting of their office. Finally, patients take these devices home and they're able to monitor their daily weight and blood pressure on devices that they're familiar with. Only this time, they will not have to do any record keeping. All of this information will be automatically uploaded into the Epion app via Bluetooth. And Thomas will now discuss the specifics of the app. So designed with simplicity and usability in mind, patients will be met with this screen upon downloading the Epion app. And after seamlessly connecting to their uh, devices and beginning to collect some data, this will be the main screen where they can see the summary of their data. Uh, patients can also explore the trends in their data and better under, to better understand the progress that they're making in their conditions. And lastly, patients can find more information on their conditions as well as contact information for their treatment team in the event they have any questions. In order to give our patients access to this technology, we will partner with third-party manufacturers for devices and market this to providers who can then recommend Epion to their patients. Epion will then receive monthly payments of $30 billed through patients' insurance. Our biggest competitor in this endeavor is the good old pen and paper, affordable, but very difficult to use. Competing tech solutions are also either too difficult to use or simply too expensive. In terms of affordability and user friendliness, Epion fills in previously unmet need for our patients. So with everyone we've talked to so far has seemed to love the uh, idea of our project. Of our product, it makes the patients, it makes the patient's life easier and also provides providers, uh, also allows providers to make more medically informed decisions about their patients. In the US, our Target, our total available market is 160 million people with either heart failure or hypertension. Our serviceable available market will be focused on the 28 million rural Americans for whom accessing care is particularly challenging. To launch Epion, our serviceable obtainable market will focus on the 315,000 rural Oregonians with either heart failure or hypertension. And to access this market, we're going to start by focusing on rural clinics in Oregon so that in partnership with, their, with the, them, their physicians will be able to recommend Epion to the appropriate patients. And our five-year financial projections are divided into two phases. Uh, phase one will be our rollout to rural Oregon, during which time we anticipate breaking even between years one and two. And our growth in phase two will be driven uh, by expanding nationally into a broader range of conditions that we monitor with our devices. 
And as future doctors, we care about our patients and we want to make their lives simpler. We believe everyone should have access to exceptional care for managing their chronic diseases, no matter where they live or what uh, kind of financial resources they have. We believe that Epion will satisfy this need. We need your support for funding app development and a pilot study to make this a reality. And with that, we'll take any questions. Great job. <laughs> All right, judges. So th this is Holly. <clears throat> it's great, fantastic, love it. A um, couple questions. Um, you. It seems to me just in my work at Kaiser Permanente, there are remote monitoring solutions that we're implementing today, right? Through Medtronic and through Holters and, you know, sleep app, you know, all these kinds of things. You, you, and you mentioned that there weren't uh, competitors. And then of course there's all the uh, device, you know, the Fitbits, the Apples, they're, they're in a different space there, right? Um, you mentioned that there weren't many competitors in your, in this space. Can you tell me how, how does your product differentiate it from what I'm what we what we use now with the Medtronic or what my Apple Watch here and others? What's the what's the big differentiator? Absolutely. So the target market that we're looking at are patients with either hypertension or heart failure. So for heart failure patients, they have to step on a scale to get their daily weight. And then to, and then some of the devices that you mentioned, um, like the Holter monitor, those do different things and they have a specific length of time that you need to be wearing the Holter monitor, for example. And that data too, it, although it, uh, you have to physically turn in your Holter monitor for them to be able to look at that data. Although there are some other Holter monitors that you can look at the data in real time, but most of the time you have to turn that in. So in our patient population who have to step on a scale or have blood pressure cuffs that you need to put on for reliable measurement. Oftentimes, even if you're able to write that information down on either a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, that information is not directly sent to the physician. In the case that a lot of patients actually do bring in either their Apple Watch data or their Fitbit data, oftentimes it's not accurate because it's not measured with the right instrument. And secondly, since there's so much information and it's so um, variable throughout the day, it's really hard to make sense of that bulk data. That's why we are introducing this AI technology where the system looks at the trends and selectively alerts the okay. provider. So they're not inundated with a lot of information. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, this is Alan. You, you folks are in a space that is going to explode in the next 10 years. This is going to be standard practice for all patients who uh, have some comorbid condition, I believe. And so uh, kudos for trying to get there and get there soon. One group I would recommend you look at right away is a, is a company called Cardia, K-A-R-D-I-A, if you haven't. Uh, they are probably two thirds of the way where you want to be. The only thing that they really don't have yet is uh, scales that are uh, electronically Bluetooth connected to the iPhone. But what your concept is right on target. You have a centralized repository for four or five key Bluetooth connected, home-based inexpensive services. So hang in there, get there soon uh it it's this is going to be a race to the market because uh this is a very easy way then to interface to emrs in uh, with physicians uh, but uh, i think you do have a little more competition than you may be aware of but take a look at cardi in particular there are a couple others out there um, i happen to just i happen to be fascinated by this space by the way so <laughs> i go out and buy whatever i can find <laughs> that for people working there um, do a little more research and then go fast. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the presentation um, and very sort of interesting idea for certain. Um, can you tell me a little bit around the profit motive in the market that's going to drive your business model? Uh, and where is, you know, what is the big financial driver for this to really take hold? So just so I get both parts of your question, the first part was uh, what's going to be driving our financial uh, gains, is that correct? 
Um, really talking about in a marketplace, things take hold. Um, you know, there has to be a like a profit motive there um, to, to drive this. So is this basically an extra cost on healthcare? Um, or is there a profit motive that somebody in the sort of business model in healthcare is really going to drive this? For example, from an insurance company perspective, would this drive down the number of claims, improve healthcare? Which that makes sense. Yeah. I can take this if you want, Lubna. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so you got at some really, really excellent points that we'd actually talked about a lot at, uh, at the outset of this. And so in terms of financial motives, this uh, type of service, being able to get reliable patient data remotely will drastically reduce the number of visits patients have to make, especially early on in titration of their medications. So really early in diagnosis of uh, hypertension or even heart failure, you need to change your medications relatively uh, in short, you know, in a short period of time. And so to be able to get this data and then to have the, the physician be able to just say, you should, you should change this dose, change this dose based on the numbers that they're seeing in real time, rather than having to go to a high blood pressure clinic or something like that every week and making an entire trip. So you're saving that the emission, like uh, environmental impact as well as uh, the monetary impact of having to make actual appointments and see uh, providers at the clinic for every single appointment. And just as a, continu a continuation, in addition to what Thomas said, it also prevents adverse outcomes later on, in particular the heart failure patients whose weight changes is correlated with um, the severity of their heart failure. So if for whatever reason, they're not able to come in and somehow this information still communicated with the physician, it decreases the number of hospitalizations, which the insurance companies in particular would be very interested in doing. Right, thank you. That really addressed my question. Great. Oh, Mohan? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I think this market is a, as Ellen said, is a very, very explosive market. It has tremendous uh, number of people trying to attack it and understand it. Uh, Livongo is an example of a company we invested in many years ago. They went public on just diabetes management using devices that you could use uh, remotely and then helping you through that process in terms of type one and type two. And they have exploded in terms of usage and we have watched them enjoyably grow because uh, they need to save a lot of patients' lives. So I see uh, the relationship between your MO and that of companies like Livongo and other companies that are working in the device space. What I would counsel is that you, you might wanna think about um, eliminating in your mind that the savings is what is the most important thing here. Um, even though savings are important, uh, they really, uh, in made patients who are comorbid like this, usually with heart failure, it takes a long time to see the ROI. So it's not an immediate, like I use this device and all of a sudden I'm, you know, Jack LaLanne. Those of you who are not old enough to know Jack LaLanne, I'm sorry, look it up. But, um, but you don't end up just suddenly becoming a transformed human being by using this device. So I want you to get really tight on exactly what is the value for this. And I would recommend to you that the value is remote monitoring and coaching. Uh, you don't have a coaching element to this. And I have seen, and research has proven that device plus coaching really makes the difference. It's a full loop solution. So I would ask you to think about how to deploy uh, not just digital solutions, because any device sent to the home has about a 15% uh, compliance. People use it like their, their, their uh, cycle machine they bought, right? It's now holding up their laundry, right? Or, uh, or their running machine that they always think they ought to do. Now they're stuck at home, they're probably doing it, but you have to keep them at home to do it. So, <laughs> uh, so please think of the human aspect of this and, and don't think that, oh, new tech. Oh, can monitor remote. Hey, doctors would love it. First of all, let me also suggest to you that the 21st Century Cures Act is going to be in effect January of 2021, where anyone blocking data will be charged and fined. So the old days of I lock my data up and I'm a hospital or I'm a doctor or I'm an insurance company is fast becoming over. Competit competition on what data I have on the customer will soon be something that's very different. So your openness to that Cures Act 
the applications running on those APIs could be incredibly powerful to give the whole world your data about the data, right? <laughs> Versus just trying to be a device focused uh, uh, product. Not that I'm putting it down, maybe you want to start that way. But think about the, the expandability of your algorithms that can give the world a different view of their own uh, heart. That's a pun on two words, okay? <laughs> Hey, Mohan, let me just pick up on your uh, comment because I think your financial model will need a lot of testing. I don't think we know yet who's going to pay for this and whether it's a technology play, an analytics play, or whether it might be a play with the care management teams that companies hire to gather data. So uh, be open, as Mohan said, to a variety of possibilities as to how the financial model might work for this technology. A lot of people are testing it. Maybe, you know, Amazon's gonna be in this space as well. Uh, <laughs> and for them, it may just be uh, how many, how many uh, appendages can you sell? B blood pressure monitors, EKG monitors, et cetera, so. Very well. Points really well taken. And thank you for those comments, Trudy. I, I think uh, maybe if it wasn't clear, if our purpose wasn't clearly communicated, I'd like to re-emphasize the fact that, you know, these are the patients that we see in the hospital setting and we see them struggle with record keeping, which unfortunately, you know, increases, you know, to your point of compliance, it decreases their adherence to be able to do these things. Because sometimes we're just simply asking too much of them. In addition to managing their disease, we are asking them to bring in records. So our hope with this was truly patient-centered, and the point was to make patients' life simpler, maybe reduce one more barrier from them seeking care, and be able to track their progress along the way. So thank you for those comments. Straight I'm on. with that. Yeah. Put yeah. that in your pitch. <laughs> I was just going to add, this is Holly again. Uh, there's a couple things just in hearing the other judges talk, a um, couple things I thought of. Number one is the COVID play. So um, we're working with a company, I think it's the name of the company is Tido Care, and they um, have a device that has some, you know, blood pressure cuffs and it's for uh, using remotely from home. And the play there is really, we don't want people to come to the hospital, right? So part of telehealth is they can monitor themselves there. As you said, the, it comes in the EMR, but they don't have to come in. And that would be doubly true for people who are in rural areas, right? You know, in addition, with hypertension and heart failure, those patients are at increased risk yes. of getting coronavirus. Exactly, also. exactly. There also might be a uh, thing with um, some of these seniors with, they have home care, they have home nurses, right? And so when the nurse comes to make their visit once a week, once, you know, I know with my mom, she has uh, someone comes once a week, that might be something also that they could look at, right? So yeah. I think there's a number yeah. of different plays there. The third thing I want to mention is something that's a phenomenon, I think. We have some patients who have implanted devices in their brains right now for epilepsy. And that data traditionally has come in to, to, to the physician's office. The, the patient has to come in and then that data is interpreted. In my I've in the last couple months, I've had two, like, I'm going to call them Gen Z, young people <laughs> who have these devices. They want the data themselves. They want to know real time. I'm mean, like, they don't want to have to wait to the physician. They want to track real time how they're doing. So there might be also a play of as people, as young people get more um, age into this, that they want to have this kind of data, right? It's no longer, you know, as Mohan said, just coming to the, to the doctor's office. I want to understand what's happening with my situation. So there might be in the future some sort of play there as well. Good Absolutely. Job. Well, let's give it up for Team Epion. Great job. My favorite slide was the one with Gigi. Um, our next, our next, our next up is Team Edge. That's me in the back seat, the only child of a single mother living in poverty. She collected cans at sunrise to help put food on the table and keep a roof over our heads. We lived on the edge, but her strength and perseverance inspired me to find a path out of poverty and to take her with me. I studied hard in school 
had a full academic scholarship, applied for grants to cover books, and graduated with honors, but was ultimately left with a mountain of debt to cover food and housing while in school. I'm not alone. For so many students, paying for college comes at the cost of their health, because four out of 10 college students were suffering from food insecurity in the last 30 days. And one out of five was actually homeless in the last year. We spoke with Tina, a homeless college student and aspiring journalist. She was frustrated after being denied her spring term due to default, a recent default on her student loans. When we connected with leaders within the industry, they too were frustrated that the needs of this invisible population continue to go unmet. But the federal government is well aware of this nationwide crisis and legislation is moving through Congress as we speak to help students in need. The problem is that colleges lack the visibility to the crises on their campus and struggle to compile data to reveal and sustain program funding. We're going to change all that. Edge Solutions is the visibility CRM for colleges addressing student wellness. With Edge, we empower college staff to connect with students via text-based assessment during the registration process, to address student needs by referring them to programs and resources that are available today. With this baseline captured, periodic check-ins will continue to track student needs while measuring the impact to secure additional funding. Edge comes with all the benefits of a cloud-based software system and implementation is easy, requiring no additional IT spend. Plus with our embedded data integration system, we work together to make sure the information remains up-to-date and secure. We stand alone in the market. When we took a look at our, our competition, CRMs today target student recruitment, onboarding, and academic engagement. Health and resource groups are left to track their impact on glorified spreadsheets. The annual operating budget of the nation's public universities and community colleges is about $500 billion. With 30% of that dedicated to student support services, we found that 4% was set aside for IT spend. That puts our total addressable market at $7.5 billion. We'll be specifically aiming to penetrate the West Coast market and our SAM is 590 million. With the 10% market penetration, we see our SAM as 59 million. Our go-to-market strategy is to develop and pilot here in Oregon. We'll be launching in 2021 at the Student Success and Retention Conference while creating allyship with key industry influencers. Our projected PL has us breaking even in about three years with revenues totaling $4.2 million by 2025. I'm so proud of our team. John, current CFO as Volunteers of America, comes with an international business development strength that will lead us to success. I, as our CEO, come with a 10-year in workflow optimization and systems integration. Maria, our CTO, is a data visualization expert coming with 20 years of customer service experience. And we're proud to say a recent executive MBA grad. Our ask today is for $200,000 in software development for software development and marketing. Because Edge Solutions, connecting colleges with students in need to create students that succeed, much like myself, so proud to have succeeded. And as you can see here on the left, a picture of my mom in front of the house that I bought for her. Thank you. And John uh, and I will be answering questions from the panel. Thank you. So Paulette, first of all, great job with your presentation and the use of storytelling. Uh, I think you did a fabulous job there. And we illustrated the challenge uh, very, very viscerally uh, in 
congratulations to you uh, for that. I have a question around the market opportunity. It sounded like the market opportunity was really the size, was it the size of the, uh, let's say education sort of budget market? I'm, I'm trying to understand how that relates to who would actually pay for this. I'll, I'll, I'll take that, uh, Paulette. Hi, Andy. This is John. So, so when we look at our market sizes, we look at we looked at the overall uh, operating operating budget across the United States, and focusing on colleges in uh, in the West Coast, and we look at specifically how much colleges and universities spent on uh, student support services, uh, and specifically how much they spent on IT related services. Our solution is a uh, customer um, uh, relation management uh, software. So that's that's the part of the uh, uh, that that's that's the section where, where we're focusing on. Got it. Thank you. That that helps a lot. So I wasn't sure. So what you're saying is, you know, you, you, um, you're effectively repositioning a portion of that student support budget to pay for the. Yes, and, and it's really a, uh, a paradigm shift for, uh, for many, we think, for many universities and colleges because so many solutions out there, so much funding is committed specifically on uh, students' uh, basic demographics, uh, their course uh, registrations, their GPA, their transcript. But what we're looking at here is a, a more holistic model. They're looking at overall student wellness. Uh, looking at their needs, uh, specifically uh, uh, food uh, needs, food insecurity, or even housing, uh, finding housing challenges. So, um, yeah, it, it's. I hope that answers your question. It does. Yeah. Thank you. That that helps a lot. It explains a little bit more around the, the business, not business model, the actual solution, and the need. But thank you. Uh, Paulette, this is Alan. Uh, you were styling at the age of five. I love those sunglasses. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think your fundamental story, uh, and I love the way you said this, uh, it's CRM for education and students. Mm -hmm. and, and that's an interesting way to tell the story about the need to understand every student. Here's my question. Every CRM, whether you use Salesforce or any of the other CRMs out there, require a lot of attention to getting good data into the system in order to get meaningful information out. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a variety of touch points that a student has in a university setting. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to just the admission process, but to track that student for the full four years of undergraduate work mm -hmm. requires a lot of attention to keep the data up. Have you given some thought to how that would work and who does that work? And it almost seems like a transformation of the way data are aggregated and, and monitored in a university set, setting where everybody has to be part of it. Is that, how are you thinking about that? Thank you, Alan. Uh, and what we see is oftentimes the, the response or the quality of the information um, has a lot to do with the time and convenience of the engagement with the students. And so what we, we've seen successful platforms that engage in, in the preferred method, uh, which is text messaging, has really had a lot of data integrity tied to it. The being able to connect with the students in um, basically directly commit, committing their, their information into a system securely, uh, which is our, our intention. Uh, so to survey these students on a regular cadence and input their, their responses into our platform so that it can be aggregated as a whole. So it's not as much of a manual lift for any of the, the administrative staff to understand the student. And by embedding it with the registration process, we see that regular cadence of understanding the student's journey and their wellness. Good, thanks. Um, this is this is Holly. Um, so it's fantastic. You know, there's a huge unmet need out there, as you as you talked about in the context of of colleges. Um, since this is a healthcare um, 
event, I, I just, I wanted to let you know that there's a huge problem we see in our hospitals also. And that is, you know, in the old days, um, when we had a, a patient uh, going to be discharged and they may be homeless, um, you know, all kinds of different issues, you know, social, our social services staff, there'll be a, usually a lady sitting there. She had, a, you know, a Rolodex, you know, and those Rolodex, that's, you know, a very outdated way of finding housing, food, all the rest. And so, you know, Kaiser Permanente recently partnered with a company, um, a nonprofit called Unite Us, that's trying to do a lift in this area around um, helping hospitals, physicians to identify social services in the community. You know, we have such a growing um, need in um, the rise of, of patients who are on Medicaid and need other things. Um, wellness is not just about healthcare, as you pointed out, right? It's about food security, housing security. Um, and so I think, you know, there's, I don't, I don't know exactly how your idea might play in with also partnering with hospitals who are looking at the same things, trying to figure out how to match up and effectively um, provide um, guidance on um, these kind of social services. But there may that, you know, no one's figured out that market yet. It's very complex. It's mm. very hard to find, you know, the, the, you got a food pantry here, but then, and their hours are this, but the next week their hours change. There's this shelter that changes. And so just keeping up with the massive amount of data that's required to be able to provide these kind of social services to a population who really needs them is so, it's such a big lift. It was, and this was something that we spent the majority of our time uh, researching. Uh, we pivoted several times throughout this process and how we would really address uh, homeless populations as they are very diverse and their needs um, continue to, to be individual by group. Uh, we, we looked actually uh, quite a bit at the Thrive Local concept that is, is uh, being developed and we were so yes. impressed with strides uh, that you're making within the community and with uh, the Unite Us platform. Uh, what yeah. we saw so hard though, so hard. I mean, oh so my hard. God, so hard. Yeah. But what we did see was that within the, the university framework and, and the community college framework, that the resources um, were actually a lot tighter. The list that, that aligned with the needs of this population uh, could be managed fairly well. Uh, and if those resources were, were ineffective or, or not meeting the needs of that population, it really was on the onus of the university to come up with new programs. And so what we're able to do is provide that insight back. Because when we uh, talked to the, the human resource leaders, what they said was, you know, we've got all these great ideas. We're just not quite sure what the students need the most or gravitate toward. And when I'm trying to make the case for budget dollars, I'm having to, you know, stretch well beyond my, my comfort zone and spend way more time just looking at uh, attendance lists and comparing that with student academic performance to make it relevant to the institution and reinforce the needs for these programs. So what we saw was a driven passion in those four walls to address the campus crises and a lack of a, a systemic technology way to really enable yeah. them in that yeah. process. Good. And so we saw that as an adoption method that we would get that traction to bring the product um, so much horsepower uh, within that particular group. But what we'd love to see is more of this interactivity um, for other markets and, and certainly to share um, with, with hospitals. And, and Holly, um, to, to briefly add to Paulette's point, you know, we, we started our pitch um, from day one is addressing the homelessness. And we ask ourselves, what does homelessness has to do with disrupting healthcare? And we see homeless as a symptom uh, as an outcome of uh, people are not being well. And we see the direct connections between, connections between healthcare uh, and homelessness. And homelessness, uh, you know, the, the next step could be someone going to an emergency room uh, for mental health services that really the emer emergency rooms are not equipped uh, to provide uh, the, uh, the, the, the treatment or the assistance. 
And as we move forward, we pivot it, uh, we focus, uh, you know, with the inputs from our coaches is we focus specifically on a hidden homeless population, which are students uh, who are, um, you know, at the edge of uh, food in insecurity or becoming homeless. Thank you. Right. Any other judges feedback? Yeah, I, I think this is a amazingly powerful uh, idea and one that uh, is an unseen need by many. So I, I really think you ought to be powered in this in this conversation and later to really pursue this because I think it has an it's an it has an avenue uh, that is less broad than social determinants of health. With everybody is talking about social determinants of health, but I see very little powerful solutions that can be targeted towards communities. And I'm not insulting SDOH, I think it's an extremely powerful message, but it lacks the rigor that I think you may be able to add to this. Now you add the word CRM, and usually that's like tracking to sell. So I would not suggest you use that term too often because it's almost like you're being monitored. Uh, I, I also like the genius of your thought with respect to when they register is when they give you feedback. That's beautiful. You realize that that is a powerful time. Uh, we did uh, at Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield, we wanted to get surveys for our own, employ uh, our own um, customers. And Google was also trying to do Google Health at the same time. And they were trying to get their customers to give them feedback about health. We beat them in terms of the total number of responses by attaching the feedback note to their uh, explanation of benefits. The minute we connected with their EOB, they gave us feedback about the service that they received. So what you're doing is an incredibly conscious, powerful way of continuing to say, it's about the, it's about the individual, not about the administrative uh, sort of you know, tracking. So really keep that kind of energy going. And you may create a category called social determinants of education. And I think you may be able to open that door. And if you use it, you better tell, tell them I said so. Um, but, but that category could be a category you dominate and understand. I use the word dominate. You own and understand for the sake of the, uh, for the, sake of the people who are suffering in that situation. One more point, if I'm allowed, Rachel um, uh, and Gigi. Uh, I think that the, the idea that education is, is elitist in the sense that it makes assumptions about the fact that when you go somewhere, that somewhere is just like my somewhere. I think you can attack that and really give it the kind of compassion and empathy that you need to kind of energize education with. Uh, I, I know the Fabian School, and many of you know, 250 students go there and half of them come to school without food. Right, and when half of them come to school without food, try not eating food for two days and see what you feel like, and see if you can study it from me when I talk to you about business transformation and everything else. I mean, it's not going to work. So, the idea that you're talking about uh, not tracking the, the the consumer, shall we say, but enabling their education through understanding their social needs, is a very very uniquely powerful concept. Now, I can criticize a number of things about. You know, do you have your business model right or anything else? But you are nascent right now. So I would say that, uh, you know, try to try to turn that one into something really directed. Also, be very careful because right now the middle market universities are scared to to all L about they don't have enough enrollment. So they're trying to get people in, let alone try to keep the ones in surviving. We're looking at a 20 to 30% drop in MBA programs, unlike ours, but others. Uh, and we're looking at drops in uh, tertiary education. And many of the universities you see around you in Oregon are gonna be more interested in how do I get more enrollees than how do mm -hmm. I survive the enrollees I have? So learn to answer that question also. Uh, it's a retention strategy mm -hmm. versus a um, uh, acquisition strategy. but learn to frame all of that into your presentation as you speak to the leaders who are administrators and the like. 
No, that's Sorry, great to bring up the relevance of, of retention. I mean, that's the biggest, the biggest pain point is correlating the programs to an increased retention and graduation rate. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, it took too much time here. No. no. Thank you. Great job. You. Great job. Ooh. Ooh, Paulette, yeah. And Paulette, good on you for buying your mom a home. That touched my heart. That must feel like so empowering. So congratulations on that amazing feat. Um, next up is Team Trailblazers. Right. Share this just a second, guys. Hi, this is Jeff and Scott from Team Trailblazer, and we are here to talk to you about our Ducks Disrupt Healthcare Solution for Mental Health, Addiction, and Homelessness. When society has a problem, our leaders usually say the following 10 words. If we had more funding, we could solve the problem. I'm sorry, but this problem is a lot more complicated than 10 word answers. My question to you is, what are the next 10 words after that? How are we going to use it to get results? This is why we are here today. We have your solution. Thank you, Scott. Um, so our team focused on disrupting the cycle that is far too often affects our veteran population. Mental health, addiction, the legal system, homelessness, and as you can see from the chain of events on the right side, that leads to suicide. We've all seen and heard the national numbers, but let's take a little closer look at Oregon. 66 to 80% of veterans seeking PTSD treatment also struggle with co-occurring chronic pain. An additional 70% of homeless veterans suffer from drug abuse and addiction. Oregon, the suicide rate is amongst, uh, amongst veterans is 2.5 times the national average. Lastly, both Oregon and our brother to the north, Washington, ranked in the top five for homelessness for veterans. And sadly, Oregon saw 11% increase last year alone for veteran population. There's an old way of doing this, talk therapy pharmaceuticals, and yes, that's my bag of drugs, yours truly in the middle from the VA, and electric convulsive or electric shock therapy. The current standards of care is both is costly, largely ineffective, and outdated. Welcome to the 21st century. The good news is that we have found a way to optimize human cognitive, cognitive performance by identifying a common denominator that can be detected in the brain, unsynchronized brain waves. We have combined safe FDA approved medical devices with our proprietary software to develop and innovate a non-pharmacological or pharmaceutical approach to improve the standard of care and the quality of life for our veterans. Our EEGs can detect the unsynchronized brain waves that can lead to the cycle that we've discussed earlier. Our proprietary software uh, analyzes that data and, uh, from the only FDA approved dry EEG lead on the market. That data then provides the doctor with a protocol to personalize TMS treatment. The TMS machine delivers, delivers a non-invasive magnetic pulse that entrains and resynchronizes your brain waves. The result, better sleep, increased focus, mood, uh, higher cognitive functioning, reduction in, in addiction cravings and chronic pain symptoms, calming the autonomic nervous system biomarkers, often, often related to um, hyper, overactive high, uh, fight or flight responses, reduced anxiety, and perhaps most importantly, restores hope and a sense of well-being. It has often been said that, this, that the, the feeling that uh, patients feel from this is that the perpetual hangover or fog has been lifted. Here's the, here's the great part. We're, uh, this is a, uh, a team that we have already assembled and are doing this in the state of Ohio. 
Here's a quote from Se uh, Senator Frank Hoagland. We work diligently to include 6 million for an innovative veteran program, which focuses on groundbreaking research for PTSD, TBI, and addiction. This is already, already in play, everybody. We have, you can see the Ohio State team. We have four or five universities, some of the, whoops, sorry, some of the major uh, Metro Health, Case Western, some of uh, this all funnels through the Ohio Mental Health and Addiction Services. So this is highly regulated and, and uh, highly regulated process. We have military and veteran organizations that are on board with this. Everything from the SOCOM to, to uh, veteran organizations like AMVETS and American Legion, Simplify Foundation. The VA is also watching this and, and participating from afar. We have collaborative research partners from UCSD, where I used to work, USC, Cedar sinai the Uniform Services University, and Texas A&M, all in this club. We are, we are using some of the, the, the top tech partners in innovative science right now for these things. And you can see some of the names down below, WHOOP, Fatigue Science, Zito, Meg Venture. Uh, Scott is going to talk to you a little bit about the go-to-market here. Our goal is to replicate this program in Oregon as a nonprofit or government solution. You have just heard about the innovative technology. However, it is more than that. It is a fully comprehensive solution. We also pre-screen uh, potentially el eligible veterans and provide post-treatment case management where we work with veterans after treatment to get permanent housing, jobs, or job training and reintroduce them to society as a fully functional person. This entire process does not work without this last piece or the trauma and cycle will continue. Our partnerships with the existing institutions also translates into low overhead and equipment provided at manufacturer costs. Additionally, our partnership with The Ohio State University means participating in an accredited FDA trial that will one day lead to insurance coverage, substantially lower costs over time, and eventual access to Americans, all Americans, that are suffering. Thank you, Scott. Uh, briefly, I had the opportunity to meet the uh, president of our wonderful university at one of our uh, EMBA co cohort when we first started. And I got about two or three minutes to talk with him. And when I told him about our program, what he simply said was, why Ohio? You should be helping us here in Oregon. I said, let's do it then. So here's our ask, legislative support. You see both Oregon and Washington, the Pacific Northwest works very closely together. We'd like to, to uh, bring everybody on board. Research institutions and universities. We got uh, Oregon, OHSU, the University of Washington Medical Center and private partners. Kaiser Permanente has a research and development uh, section. So does Swedish Medical Center, which I am currently working with as well to try to uh, find some in, into the Pacific Northwest. That's what that's our ask. That's what we're looking for. About eight years ago, I was one of 20 veterans that was chosen for the first TMS pilot cohort to study the effects on veteran on, on the veteran community. I was going downhill quickly, and this program literally redirected my life. It gave me my purpose back, my new mission, and yes, it's personal. That's my father, a Vietnam veteran, and that's my daughter down in the corner there. With that, thank you very much for, every, for everybody listening to our pitch. Simplify. Woo! Woo! Great job. Don't know how to get this off now. Hold on. All right, judges. Is it off of there yet? Sorry. Hey, Jeff, it's Holly from Kaiser Permanente. Hello, Holly. First, I want to thank you for your service, that of your father and your daughter. So thank you very much. Thank you for paying your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it comes with going to law school, something I, about that. I don't know. Somebody's yeah. got to pay right? Yeah. So fantastic. I, I, want to, I want to know more, right? So it's just a glimpse. You gave us a glimpse. And now I'm sort of curious, and I'm going to have to do a little bit of research. But when you said, um, the one thing that I, I'm missing is when you said help us, who's the us? Maybe I missed that. I'm trying to figure out um, what are you, who are, you know, um, yeah, tell me a little bit more about the us and are you a, I hope you're going to answer yes. Are you a veteran? Um, you're going to be a, a, a veteran led company or nonprofit? 
One hundred percent. It's it's not a nonprofit, but we have you saw a list of nonprofits on the side. Yes. Um, I have stood up a, a group with the former Navy SEAL retired. I am medically retired uh, after yeah. five back surgeries as a Marine myself, and we set up a veteran-owned service-connected global veteran yes. business. And we are going to, and we called it Team Argonaut. And if you know the story of Argonaut, we're leading the charge to go find the Golden Fleece and some solutions. So we are, uh, for somehow, some way, because I was one of the first veterans who went through this, I have a mental, uh, I have a master's degree in mental health counseling and addiction, and I was struggling. I understood conceptually how to do this. I just couldn't get everything to slow down in some way. So once I went through the treatment, they asked me, do you want to stay around and help your brothers and sisters? And I was like, yes, I do. You know, I've been struggling for a mission for five or six years, not sure what to do with my life and where I fit in. And they said, let's, let's do it. We're going to put you on point, go down and start this. So what Team Argonaut essentially does is the recruiting, the education, some of the training, and all the things that, that people fall through the cracks, the case management. It, this is not a silver bullet solution. This is a catalyst for change but we still have to walk people through the process and rebuild them. So Team Argonaut is actually myself and Scott, I'm hoping to bring him in. Uh, I'm, an, I'm, I'm from Oregon, I was born in Portland. Nothing would make me happier. I came back here specifically to go to the University of Oregon so I can have an, an O on my wall. Um, I'm a diehard Oregon fan. So nothing would make me happy having this in, in the Pacific Northwest. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, thank you for shining the light on this incredibly important uh, problem that we're, that we're facing. Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable that uh, the solution in Ohio is not more prevalent. Because um, it sounds like it's very, very effective. What do you see is preventing that broader adoption? And from that, what challenges do you think you have to overcome to make this a reality in Oregon and Washington? So the, the first thing is why Ohio? And they were, they were kind of the epicenter for this opioid crisis. There's books written about it, everything else, them in West Virginia. They're spending $1.2 billion a year on this problem and losing. That's more than they spent on K through 12 education by about a quarter of a billion dollars. That's not sustainable. So one of the centers that I quoted you is a retired Navy SEAL. He had heard and seen some of his brothers in arms, SEALs, go through this and report back to him how ground, uh, how, how changing, how much has changed their life and kind of got him back on focus. So he's sitting there as a new senator, doesn't know any better that he can't do these things and just starts going charging straight ahead like a real leader does. And he, he got me on the phone. He said, Jeff, actually he calls me Jeffrey, but Jeff, you want to do this and bring it to, to Ohio and help your, help our, our veterans out here and, and, and kind of start the foundation, I'm going to get you some money. And we started, he called me out there. We lobbied for about three weeks. We talked to every senator and, and house and governor. We shook hands, kissed babies, whatever we had to do. And, and they said, you know what? Let's give this a shot. What is $6 million in innovation? Let's give this a shot. These, these guys are saying, and girls are saying this works. Right now we're just throwing 1.2 billion away and we're just talking about doubling that or you know, putting another 20% on trying to throw money at. So they gave us a shot. So your second part of your question is why or what barriers do I see? Well, this is a new technology. As you see, we're using other people's in, uh, you know, technology and stacking a process there. Um, one of the things that's been a problem to date is that the two companies I had worked for, the first company and then the spinoff company from that, they haven't had or didn't have interest in doing the research piece. And so that's why I broke off to do this rigorous research through an FDA IRB trial through Ohio State. And that's what we're trying to do. And anybody knows about those things, we need to have multiple locations across the country to make sure it's not the water in the area that made this better. And that's why we need some partners out on the West Coast. We already have West Virginia on, on board for next, their next cycle. Texas is, on, is, is in discussion. So is Florida North Car and uh, North Carolina. So in Indiana, so we are, we're moving forward. I want some of the West Coast. I don't want to spend the rest of my life over there. I want to come back home. So uh, that's kind of where we're at. And that's kind of one of the roadblocks. But our goal is, is to make this already FDA approved for clinical depression treatment available for different diagnosis. And that'd be PTSD, TBI, addiction, because it works. Thank you. I like where you're going and uh, good luck with this. This is important. 
Thank you. Hey, Jeff, this is Alan. Uh, you know, uh, this issue of mental health, uh, dual diagnosis treatment is just a shadow problem in this country. And fortunately, it's starting to get some attention. But as you pointed out, we really don't have a lot of great solutions just yet. Uh, so where, where I think you're going with this is you've got some control studies uh, underway. And uh, as soon as you have the data, I think you will have, uh, especially if the data proves the idea, uh, you'll have a great solution here. A lot of opportunities will come your way. Uh, secondly, your service to this country combined with your mental health uh, training makes you perfectly situated and suited to lead something like this. I mean, you have obvious and instant credibility on a subject of this uh, import. Uh, the last question I have is that there's a whole discipline, um, science, some people call it pseudoscience, but I think there's some science behind it of what's called neurofeedback. And it appears that you're kind of in that space. Yes. Uh, how do you, um, I assume you understand that field. How do you, does what you're doing relate to some of the work in neurofeedback? Yeah, so, so neurofeedback is, is uh, kind of rewiring neural pathways through uh, a, diff a set of processes that they put you through and they're kind of read and react type thing. What we're doing is we're cheating the system. We're using a TMS machine to um, synchronize neurons because they react to a magnetic field. They don't have a choice but to, to fire, action potential, fire a neuron. It's like a, it's like a band. A great analogy is a band. They're a marching band, they're on the field. Half of them are going left and right, playing off music and everything else. And it just doesn't sound very good. What we're able to do it with that magnetic pulse is set that pulse to your intrinsic frequency that we get off the EEG. This is where TMS change is a little different than what it was before. We're using a driver to say, hey, size 10 shoe doesn't fit everybody. It just doesn't. You may be at nine. I could throw you in a 10, but it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be as comfortable. Or you may be 11, I could squeeze you in a 10, but it's not gonna work. So we're actually taking the EEG, finding your intrinsic frequency based on the rest of the coherence of your brain wave patterns and treating it and getting everybody to say, hey, you're at 10.5, go. And, it, and it'll, it'll have to fire at that cadence while we're treating it. And over a period of time, usually four to six weeks, it is a long uh, commitment but because we have to retrain neurons and also depends on the cause of your injury, the, how long it's happened, some of these other factors that go into there, but we're retraining that neuron to fire at a cadence. So then you get a nice harmonic, stable system. One of the things you said earlier was the data. The, the companies I worked for before had done their own internal data. And that's all we have right now to use. And SOCOM and some of these other people, I don't know if everybody knows what SOCOM is, but seals, maybe seals and some of the special commands. They, they are 100% behind this, but they want some real data. That's why they're so excited about this partnership with the, the, Ohio, the Ohio State University, because that's what we're doing. We're taking the, we're taking the black box off, we're, we're, we're running down science and we're exposing it and publishing it. And that's where I want Oregon, OHSU, UW, we need everybody on this page because we're gonna need numbers and we need to get to this fast because 20 to 22 or eight to 10, I don't care commit suicide a day. And we all know that this is a veteran need problem, but I can use the veteran controls in my, in my, uh, in my, in my grasp, which is housing and some of the other things we can factor that we can prove this matters. And then we can roll it out. It's not going to be approved for just veterans. It's going to be approved for PTSD for everybody. That's the key. Uh, well, Jeff, we, uh, you know, full court press is needed here. We ought to be doing this in Oregon. Uh, we've got OHSU and, and VA right next to each other. Uh, one of the things I think maybe we could do at OEMBA is uh, Joe Robertson, who is the past president of OHSU, was my classmate in 97, and we ought to get Joe involved in this. Please. I would love this conversation. We can bring in any of the medical doctors from Ohio State and around the country that are working on this, whatever, whatever. That's what we wanted out of this. We want connections because this is a massive pro project and it's gonna take everybody on deck to start dealing with it. Okay, let's figure out a way to connect after this. Yes, sir, thank you. All right. So um, I, I'm compelled to uh, make my points as well. Uh, I really am appreciative of what you've uh, sacrificed for our country. Uh, I'm a former 
infantry soldier and sure. spent three years uh, sticking branches in my pants and hiding in the jungle as well. So I understand at least one part of what it feels like to be uh, a victim of our, our battles. Now, um, I've spent 20 years trying to do what you're trying to do. And I'd like to offer you some thoughts. Uh, I ran a company called BaseFit. We started with vets, helping other vets. It was on mindfulness, uh, physical training, mental fitness, and then exercise and food and nutrition. We went all the way up to the Pentagon, got picked as the best one while we did case studies in five different regions and the University of Pittsburgh picked us as the best. It went nowhere when it hit the Pentagon because procurement got over and it was all about pricing and all about proof. And it never quite got the traction on a national scale. We still have the company. I still uh, have it in my portfolio. We've pivoted, pardon the pun, to uh, focus on corporate uh, issues on mindfulness because that was easier to break through than the military apparatus that you and I know exists. Um, but we, I still have assets of all those relationships all the way up to the Pentagon, uh, including the local assets uh, that have always been beside this problem and wanting to help. So those assets are available to you if you wanna call me uh, and connect. I'm really sad Gary Mortensen couldn't make it today because he is also one who is very, very much taken by the field of supporting our fellow brothers and sisters who have fought in battles for us um, and continue to suffer from it. So I can get you connected to Gary or Rachel can, we can help you there. I'm also a speaker and a communicator with the Honor Foundation, which is based on California that has many a connections into the apparatus that you need to be connected into. And I'm in constant conversations with at least three admirals and two generals who I know. So if you need help, we, would, I would be honored to help you uh, and honored to give you as much connections, but it would be important that you really hone your message tightly in terms of how well it does in terms of impact. But that is not the only thing. I think you have to plan for scale and how do you get it replicated? I think it's a good idea that Oregon back you in some shape or form, but you got to get the vets to back you too. So try to get our fellow brothers and sisters who are in this situation to back you in any way possible. And even that we can help. I, my company can help you uh, in terms of connections there because we have a huge veteran population that might be able, available to you if I can work the right angles. And thank you again. Th thank right. you for your service. And right. can I respond to that, Rachel, real quick? Sorry. Can, I, okay. can I respond to his? To yeah, his, yeah. go right said? ahead. <laughs> Thank you for your service. And we actually had a chance to briefly speak um, also on, to, on that rooftop uh, event. I remember. And uh, I remembered what you said to me. And that has been a, a conversation within my group. And uh, you're 100% right. And a lot of the things that you're talking about are part of the external services that have to surround this TMS. And I think there is a little more traction uh, at, uh, they have a, a SOCOM because of their suicide rates are increasing and their um, operators are valuable. So that may be where it starts. So I'd love to talk with you offline about this. I, it, this has to happen and I'm very excited. Thank you for your feedback. Pleasure. All right, let's give it up for Team Trailblazers. Great job. <laughs> Woo. And now we have our final team. Team Sensible, are you ready to go? Let's see. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Man, those are some tough acts to follow. Um, I really appreciate the passion and innovation of everyone who presented before us. And I'm really excited now to have my chance to talk about what's exciting me these days. I'm Sarah McCrory. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sensible. 90% of people spend 22 hours a day indoors. You're breathing recycled air and this air is full of germs called bioaerosols that contaminate HVAC systems and are pushed back into the air that you breathe. As someone recently said, one man's cough becomes another man's breath. And that's really, really true indoors. Um, every time you cough or sneeze, you're adding bioaerosols to the air. 
and COVID has been shown to spread through HVAC systems. Bioaerosols have emerged as the largest pollutant of the modern age and are responsible for $21 billion in economic losses every year. Sensible has developed a device that ensures that every enclosed area is safe through continuous detection and monitoring. Sensible is a compact, affordable, reliable device that provides hourly alerts on contamination in HVAC units. Data is sent to an app on your phone, and if contamination is detected, an alarm sounds letting you know. The dashboard collects data that can be useful to the public health community and can integrate with contact tracing apps. Our product is simple to use with easy to change consumables and will be protected by design and utility patents. Our business model is based on three revenue streams. There's the one-time purchase of the sensor unit and monthly purchases of chips, buffers, and filters. Service, maintenance, and consulting provide additional recurring revenue. Of course, COVID-19 is an immediate threat to our society and economy, but really the problem is so much bigger than just COVID. Influenza kills 62,000 Americans every year, and there are 23 million cases of norovirus. Sensible is prepared to immediately address bioaerosol pollution beyond just COVID-19. In year one, we'll develop multiplex chips that combine aptamers for SARS-CoV-2, seasonal variants of influenza, and norovirus all in one chip. In year two, we'll add panels for fungus, mold, pollen, and bacteria. Customers will be able to order pre-made panels, or they can design a custom panel with up to four aptamers based on their own needs, providing multiple purchasing options. Why Sensible? Surface testing is commercially available through several companies. And while this is a good way to get information, it's slow and a bit cumbersome. Alternatively, you can buy a handheld particle detector that detects particles as small as one micron. And this tells you that something's there, but it doesn't tell you what it is. Sensible is an automated solution that tells you what's there, how much of it there is, and where it is in your building, all through a convenient notification on your phone. The total potential market for this product is any enclosed shared space, and <laughs> I mean, really, that's huge. So we had to narrow it down, and we used the following criteria to do that. Size of the segment, degree of building automation, post-COVID financial health expectations, and the value proposition. Based on these criteria, we selected assisted living facilities. Long-term care has been particularly hard hit by the pandemic. There have been over 4,000 active outbreaks of COVID, and nationally, they account for 42% of COVID-linked deaths, and Oregon's even worse. Our long-term care facilities account for 57% of COVID-linked deaths. Um, financially, COVID has created an additional operating cost of over $3,750 per day. And if this trend continues, this will burden each facility with additional costs of $1.375 million per year. We believe that we can capture 10% of the mid-sized assisted living market in year two. Post-COVID financial expectations show that the assisted living market grows about 2% this year to become a $42.5 billion industry in 2021. As you can see, we expect steady growth through market penetration and expansion and are positioning ourselves for acquisition. Potential buyers include Carrier and Siemens. Our go-to-market strategy leverages existing sales channels by working with system integrators who sell directly to customers and product placement in HVAC manufacturer catalogs. Our marketing efforts will directly target decision makers at assisted living facilities and will include campaigns aimed at educating them about the problem and solutions. We'll also highlight the cost savings that our product can create through triggering cleanup of contaminated systems and real-time monitoring that lets you know if it was effective. The development of this product would not have been possible without the talents of our team. Ben Camel helped engineer and design the solution from the biochemistry to the components. Joel Copeland helped develop our sales and marketing strategy. And finally, we're really excited to have Kevin Vanden Weimeilenberg join our team. Kevin is a professor of architecture at the University of Oregon and a renowned specialist in the microbiome of the built environment. Finally, our board of advisors was instrumental in our process. We would like to extend a special thanks to each of them for their time and assistance. Today, we're asking for $3,000 to complete prototyping. We'll be seeking an additional $2.3 million in year one to bring our product to market. In addition to your consideration, we've been offered the opportunity to secure support through the University of Oregon. Please join the U of O as an early investor in our company and breathe easy as we make the world a safer and healthier place. I'm happy to review financial projections and answer any other questions that you might have during the Q&A. Thanks. Woohoo!
Okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> uh, fill the void. Uh, I keep, this is amazing because just yesterday I was talking to one of my legal colleagues and I said, we have this big uh, return to work playbook, right? Kaiser Permanente. I work in our headquarters, which is uh, 27 uh, stories. So I said, you know, I was looking through the playbook and I couldn't find anything about the HVAC system. Like, you know, there's everything about the elevators and social distance. I said, you know, it's a huge building. What are they doing about HVAC? I mean, who's, I never hear it come up in these crisis, in these, in these uh, command center calls and all. So very timely presentation. So thank you. Um, thank you. It makes me wonder though, um, I didn't, I didn't see what, you, you haven't filed a patent yet, it sounds like. Maybe you haven't mm -hmm. filed, but I would, I'd, be, I'd be curious because um, just everyone's thinking about this issue, right? Yeah. That um, what's the space out there? What's the IP space look like out there? Um, so right now it's open and we actually plan on filing patents pretty quickly. We're working right now, like I said, on prototyping. Certainly if we win tonight, we'll be putting the money towards that endeavor. Um, but we definitely plan on moving as quickly as we can. And that's part of why having the support of the university and other people who can really help us get going right out of the gate is important because time is of the essence. Um, we believe that we've landed on a solution that um, is novel um, and where we've been kind of monitoring the space as closely as we can, we haven't seen others using a similar solution. So we're, we're feeling, you know, I mean, who knows, right? But you give it a shot. Yeah. You could, you're welcome to prototype it in my, our office building. <laughs> Thanks. I'm really excited. The most, yeah. the thing that Gigi had me cut down a lot of on this was um, talking about the, the guts of the machine because I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. It's so much fun. And like the um, mechanical engineer in me just can't wait to start tinkering and messing. So I, I dialed that back to talk about the market, but that's the fun part. <laughs> yeah, great. Fantastic. Thanks. So uh, Alan here, uh, if you got uh, the money you needed tonight, uh, what's your time frame for completing the prototype? Um, I believe that we could complete it really quickly. I think um, we could certainly have a proof of concept prototype within a couple of weeks. It's just a matter of getting some off the shelf components together to put it um, in order. So I, I believe the time frame is actually fairly rapid. And then if I understood your presentation, uh, this technology is built into or part of a centralized HVAC system. Is that correct? I mean, it monitors through return air and other ducting yeah. in the building, correct? One of the correct. things you might want to think about, if that's the case, is that a lot of assisted living facilities don't use centralized systems. They use standalone in-room uh, heating and cooling. And you might want to think about, or at least test that idea in the market, because I think if I understand your technology, you really need these centralized systems that draw air through a building, uh, correct? Um, yeah, and that's part of why we really avoided the small part of the segment of the market, because the small market, the small assisted living facility market is the largest part of the market, but it typically includes a lot of buildings that look like homes, kind of residential spaces. Um, right. Once you get into medium and large size, then you do typically get into structures that have a lot of building automation, including larger HVAC. So I, I agree with what you're saying, and it's definitely something we considered. Well, I'll tell you, if you get a prototype that works, uh, you're going to have people uh, at your doorstep immediately. It's a, it, it's yeah. a, you know, this issue is not going to go away. What we've learned is through this experience is that we've been putting up with aerosolized uh, infections uh, for many, many years. I, I told my wife the other day, when I fly in the wintertime, I sometimes feel like I'm on a TB ward, you know, with all the hacking and sneezing that's going on. Uh, and so it's part, it's an underappreciated part of disease prevention. So kudos. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been really fascinating, like going back and doing the literature review for this um, and just seeing how long it's been acknowledged, widely acknowledged in the literature that this is a problem. Um, you're right, I think it's just underappreciated, but COVID unfortunately came on the scene, silver lining perhaps will attend to this problem now. 
Hey, Sarah. Fantastic uh, presentation, and I really Thank like you. your uh, focus here. I think that's, that's terrific. And certainly, creating the product in itself is a challenge. I actually think you may have an even bigger challenge, and that is global logistics and support. Because you're manufacturing a physical product, you're going to have to support that. You're going to have to be able to ship that out, you're going to have to get the capital to be able to do it um, up front, which working capitals, yeah, that's a, that's a challenge in itself when you haven't got a proven model, let's say. So how are you thinking of overcoming that in your go-to-market strategy? Um, I mean, it's a really good question. I do think that, you know, product plays have that specific challenge, there's definitely a lot of risk tied to them. And so, you know, getting investors that are willing to put up the type of capital that it takes to tool up um, a factory and start producing a device um, is going to be hard. And it's part of why I'm so thrilled to have um, teamed up with and attracted the attention of the university, because I hope that it helps de-risk that to a certain extent and helps um, other investors come on board more confidently in terms of how we'll manage the global supply chain piece of it, um, the interior will primarily be injection molded plastic. Um, and so, you know, there are plenty of domestic facilities that can produce it at the scale that we intend to produce it at in years two and three when we actually go to market. Um, really, you know, we're just going to leverage existing supply chains. Um, to do that and hopefully get as much of it done domestically initially as we can. Some of the um, chemical components will be sourced through international chemical supply chains, um, but primarily coming from Europe actually, so not an Asian supply chain. But yeah, the complexities of that are real. And one of the team members that we're actually looking for is someone who has a really strong background in manufacturing and supply chain because you know those guys are smart and we want one of them on board. Yeah, one thing I'd encourage you to think about, Sarah, is the partnership model. You focus on what you do really well, which is the IP, and create a model, whether it's licensing or it's a manufacturing partner or somebody, have somebody who does that side really well, do that for you, because this could be a real challenge for you. And, and I know Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I love Thank your you so much. Thanks. Yeah, in open disclosure, I mean, you and I have talked about this privately when you had your first concept idea a few months ago. And uh, so very good work on developing it to such an advanced level, Sarah. And also open disclosure, Dr. Professor Kevin, who is at the University of Oregon is now in your team. I didn't know that until this presentation. Uh, clearly, he is also very well versed technically with the architectural demands and the chemical demands of air ventilation systems. So I applaud that you got together and it's actually now uh, got some momentum associated with uh, this good story, this good narrative. Now, if I know the story right, um, it tests the existence and the abundance of COVID-19, uh, the disease itself. And it, apply, it applies to buildings that has an HVAC system that allows for you to detect it. So you either see it as an existence of or an abundance of, and there's some kind of mathematics on what that means. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, I think there are going to be, um, you know, one of the things that we're gonna be looking at is the trend. So whether it's going up or down, right? So tracking contamination over a period of time um, is the goal and allowing folks to take some action to apply some remediation and then to have ongoing testing to see if that remediation has worked. Um, I think certain diseases, you know, it's more binary where any contamination is a problem and you want an absolute yes or no. Right. Um, and certain other pathogens, there's gonna be a disease burden that can be borne or filtered out and taken care of through other mechanisms. So um, I don't think I have as sophisticated of, a, of an answer as perhaps you want, but it's definitely something yeah. that we're thinking about different disease dynamics and how they work within the built environment. 
Yeah, I, I also second the point made that you might think about uh, being the intellectual engine behind and the prototyping engine behind the story rather than concentrating on scale because mm -hmm. scale is a nightmare when it comes to many layers of connectivity and the supply chain, not only that, the relationships to building manufacturers at the high end and what they really want to know and what they don't want to know. And so um, it's not obvious to all of us that people may not want to know a little bit. They want to know a lot. And if you only have a little bit, they don't want to know it. So please uh, think about what it's like to talk to a building manufacturer, a person who has a, owns multiple buildings, and how they want to approach this may not be all saying, oh, this is great. You have an experimental technology that might tell me I can't go back to work. You know, and so how do you get past that story uh, and give comfort to people who are legitimately worried, but also worried that it's too little data that they can't do anything about. So all those pieces have to come together. And I've learned in starting companies, make it full loop through relationships or make it full loop as your own company. Close mm -hmm. the loops. You know, don't just say, I give it to you, you can do what you want. Say, what do you do with it, right? And I think Kevin, your professor, CMO, CTO, whatever, I think he gets it. He can change the building to make sure that the ventilation works. I think that's brilliant conversations I've had with him, uh, coincidentally, as well with you. So this is great. I, I, I applaud the idea. I just hope that you think of your business model more than anything else right now. Yeah. And you know, just to kind of reflect back on that, um, one thing, Andy, that you might find interesting is that the U of O does have a well-developed relationship with Siemens. And so as we develop our partnership out, we will be exploring more of an industrial kind of partnership. Um, I was encouraged for the purposes of this pitch to really kind of, you know, come up with a business model and the plan. And so in some ways, it's been really fun and I've enjoyed the exercise of putting together for this pitch, but really the type of product that we have is, you know, we're doing a product play. It's about licensing, it's about acquisition, it's about those large scale um, partnerships. So unfortunately the kind of exercise of this pitch didn't lend itself to that type of information. And I'm happy to be able to talk about it now um, afterwards. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? That was fun guys. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, let's give it up for Sensible. Amazing job, amazing. Let's give it up for everybody. Well done. Well done. First of all, I am blown away. The judges have a very tough job ahead of them. I don't envy them. You all did an amazing job. I'm just so, I'm blown away. So congratulations, good jobs with the pitching. And actually judges, so many great um, and intuitive and deep responses and, and feedback. It was just so engaging to listen to the whole process. Um, so the next stage of this event is the judges are going to adjourn for 15 minutes. Um, the team leads, we would like you to go into a breakout room. We're, we're gonna be chatting with each of you. But while the rest of you are waiting for this 15 minute period, we're gonna come back at 840 there's gonna be a slideshow that we're gonna feature um, that will show you photos from the original kickoff event. So we will see you all back here at 8.40. Just say thank you again for uh, your patience. Um, extended time in the, in the review process ultimately means there was a lot to think about and so great job to all of you. Um, and before we announce the winners, I wanted to make sure that um, we allow some feedback from the judges so they can provide you some some of the details of the things they discussed, and um, I'll have them go ahead and take it away. Well, wow, that's all I can say. Just fantastic uh, presentations on all front. I would say that the judges uh, were friends when we started, and we are still friends when we ended, but uh, we suddenly had cordially conver conversed about the value of every one of uh, the the, the, the companies. NEVAP is looking at a pressing need. Um, um, I don't know how to pronounce your name. C-A-Y-C-E. Uh, case, KC, um, if you're French. Uh, case, but uh, if you're not, was, was really focused on a market and trying to address a, a large market. Epion looked like they were finding uh, answers to a very big disease 
problem and yet a very nice presentation. Edge, uh, what can I say? You have an edge on, on, on a very deep emotional issue that, uh, that requires attention, trailblazers. Another tremendous mention towards our vets and what we need to do to save their lives as much as they've saved ours. And then sensible looking at uh, the way in which uh, air makes a difference to all of us. I mean, every one of these things have an emotionality, a tonality, and an energy that um, I must say uh, makes it worthwhile to, uh, to join a, mo a group like this. It creates hope above anything else, for me anyway. So thank you, all of you. Yeah, and Mohan, adding to what you, you said, I and mean, I totally agree with the, the, the content, um, but also the way all of you presented so well in four minutes. I mean, four minutes is a ridiculously short period of time, and I was incredibly impressed with the clarity that you brought to your presentations, um, and I get to sit through lots and lots of pitches, and you did really, really well, way, way, way above the average of what I normally see. So kudos to you for that and clearly demonstrates the work you've done together through the program. And I hope you've learned a lot from working with your, your teammates and from the experience uh, that you've been a part of. Uh, this, this is, is Holly. Oh, go ahead, Holly. I was gonna say, this is Holly. and. Um, I think all of us in business, we sit through lots of point presentations and presentations. And what struck me for all of these is uh, the storytelling, the personalization, the passion that you had. You know, that makes us, as I think listeners, feel what you're feeling. And I loved um, in each of the presentations how you told us how you were solving a problem, but then how it was a, there was a story in there and um, stories were told in very different ways to reflect the different um, I, you know, offerings that you had. But I, I, I held my attention for every minute. I was like, oh, I just wanted to jump through the screen. So thank you, just keep it up. Cause this, this, is what, you know, this is what successful business or nonprofit looks like. Talking to people, uh, telling a story, uh, you know, relaying the numbers, but making us feel what you feel. So thank you. There's obviously uh, just a tremendous amount of time and um, thought given to this. The, the uh, amount of innovation represented in these presentations is truly remarkable. Um, you know, you dug deep to, to get to a result. Uh, just to pick up on one of Holly's comments, uh, some of you, uh, most of you probably don't know that I started my career in communications, marketing, and radio. And um, one of the things that we always said to people is you've got to be able to explain something simply as if you're talking across the table to your mom. And uh, I just want to punctuate Holly's comments about the stories. Being able to distill these complex ideas into uh, easily understandable thoughts and I, stories uh, for those of us who come from a variety of backgrounds is a real talent and skill and you've demonstrated that tonight. There are three uh, call outs that I want to make. Uh, number one, uh, Casey, I think your idea here is a good one. It, uh, it really needs uh, more uh, development in my view. Um, and, um, you know, this idea of mental illness, as we talked about in the presentation, is just so, um, it, it's, it's in need of a significant and different solution. We have not given credence over the last 50 years to the needs of those with uh, substance abuse and mental uh, health issues. And so it's, that's sorely needed. Um, and then uh, the edge idea is one that is whose time has come. Uh, it really uh, needs, the universities need something like this. Um, that said, I also wanna give some context for us as judges. Some of what we have to think about is the context of our time. We are in a very disruptive and different time. We have seen things that we never expected to see in our lifetimes. As a matter of fact, a lot of colleagues will say, 
Uh, this is a, an experience of life that we are likely to encounter only once. Actually, we hope we only encounter it once and we will learn a lot. And life, there will be a pre-COVID and a post-COVID life in society. So uh, with that said, um, it's been a pleasure and I uh, thank you for all the work you put into this. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, judges, for your, your feedback. Um, and honestly, to echo their sentiments, you've all done such great work. And I want to also again say thank you to Stoller Family Estate for providing additional incentive um, to do well on these, not only presentations, but to, to get something out of this opportunity. And Ducks Disrupt Healthcare was meant to be an opportunity for each of you, not only to develop um, an idea or a concept, but to develop the idea of, of being on a team and pivoting and kind of working your way um, through this process because it doesn't end here. So um, to reiterate, third place, as you saw in the email, $500 winner, second place, $1,500 winner, and first place, a $3,000 winner. So without much further ado, our third place winter, winner for tonight is Sensible. Congratulations, Sensible. Thanks, guys. Woo! We really felt like, I mean, the judges, uh, there was so much discussion, but we felt like, Sensible, you offer so much relevancy to what's happening now, to the very air that we breathe, as Mohan said, um, and kind of what it, what it makes us think about and how we operate. Um, while HVAC was a, uh, you know, a technology that changed the way that we work, we know that it's ultimately going to change the way that we think about how diseases spread. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your work there. Second place, $1,500 winner, Epion. Congratulations. <laughs> Epion, your team uh, was exactly that. I think that was a sentiment felt across uh, you know, all of the judges and some of the additional time spent was how your team not only seamlessly provided a presentation that was compelling, but that you really do seem cohesive and that uh, you know, this is something that you've been thinking about you know, uh, and working really hard at. And so your team, we hope that you continue to work on uh, what you've developed, not only you know, for the next few months, but you know, whatever may come your way. So congratulations. And then our first place winner of the $3,000 prize is NEVAP. Congratulations, NEVAP. And of course, you know, NEVAP, what you're doing um, in the space is all relevant to us now, um, very relevant. We're uh, not only excited about what's been happening, you know, out here in, um, in our healthcare uh, uh, in, in the space currently, but we're excited to see what we'll do as you continue to move forward. Again, congratulations to your team, and, uh, and thank you all again for participating in this event. It's been an absolute pleasure for us. Yeah. Well, now is the time to celebrate. Um, we wanted to, first of all, acknowledge, as Paul said, Gary Mortensen, the Stoller Family Estate, James Falvey. They are the folks that came to us saying that they wanted to be the sole sponsors for this event. Um, I wanted to thank our judges, your feedback tonight. Oh my goodness, it was just unbelievable. The pitches were amazing, but the feedback was equally as inspiring. So I want to offer a toast, and I have some Stoller wine here, <laughs> but this is to everybody involved in this event. And the fact that nobody gave up, everybody continued on, um, you stayed true to your teams, you developed over time, and I'm just so proud of the entire event, everybody involved in it. So cheers to everybody here tonight. Hey, thank you, Stoller. <laughs> Congratulations. Cheers. Yes, cheers. <laughs> I was mentioning when, is my mic on? Yes. Um, when we were meeting with the team leads during the interviews, I wanted to mention to the broader group that I'm a big fan of finding a way to get back together once social distancing is no longer a thing. So you have my commitment that we're gonna find a date and a time in the future for all of us to get together to celebrate and acknowledge what we accomplished together. Um, so we will continue to watch what's happening, especially here in Multnomah County, but we'll find a, a time and a place for us to get together and celebrate. I think this whole event is a win. 
and we are looking forward to Ducks Disrupt 2.0 for next year, and hopefully no disruption, right? <laughs> um, but finally, we wanted to get a little bit of time dedicated to Mark Anker and Maddie Madeline Eastman, who are our student ambassadors. They're going to speak a little bit about the process and the event, and uh, we just wanted to acknowledge them and allow them have, to have a voice here tonight. Hey, Rachel, Jeff, I, before we go to that, I, I think you two deserve a lot of uh, our thanks for making this all happen. I will tell you from yeah, the here. judge's perspective, it was really, you made it easy for us. So Aww. thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank really you. appreciate that. Yes, and I wish I could take Gigi to every meeting I've ever had in my life. <laughs> yes, <laughs> same. <laughs> So uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Mohan and everybody else. I want to thank everybody involved who helped support, coordinate, and execute this event, especially during these challenging times. This includes Gary Mortensen and uh, Stoller Family Estate Sponsor, who without their support, this event would never be a reality. Mohan and Alexis Roloff from the Cambia Health Solutions team, Andy Robbins, Oliver Alexander, Buddy Burke, all of our esteemed judges, mentors, the OEMBA Alumni Association, the whole team, Rachel, obviously, Paul, Wendy, Sandy, Kit, the whole PDX tech team, and of course, Gigi, obviously, <laughs> whose infinite wisdom, innovative spirit, personality, humor, yes. um, have been a beacon <laughs> and driving force for this event. Yeah, and um, the dedication and thoughtfulness the teams have demonstrated throughout this program have been truly admirable. Um, we've learned so much from our interactions and relationships. Um, these are really challenging times and we've been forced from our routines and have been balancing different sets of priorities, all of which are compounded by the current public health crisis and seismic shifts in our social and economic foundation. So um, the true sincerity, time and dedication um, demonstrated by all of you, um, thinking beyond yourselves is truly inspiring. So, um, our hope is that by creating this forum, it keeps us all motivated to create a more equitable healthcare system for the future. And both Mark and I have gained so much from this experience and we're beyond pleased um, at the traction that it's gained. Thanks to all of you. So um, thank you participants as well for being here and putting in your effort. Yeah, our hope moving forward is, it, is that this event serves as a catalyst for true innovation for the future of healthcare in Oregon and throughout the world and thoughtfully addresses existing disparities highlighted during this COVID-19 experience. This experience has definitely ignited that entrepreneurial spirit and we're both extremely fortunate to be a part of the first annual Stoller Family Estates Ducks Disrupt Health. It's a long sentence. Nice. I'm not sure if everybody knows this, uh, but many of the teams didn't even know each other before this event and hopefully learned a lot, not only about entrepreneurship and innovation, but about each other. So thank you again for sharing your ideas and enthusiasm you are key to what has made this a valuable and memorable event. Gigi? Hey, hey Mark, did you notice something? Did anyone notice what colors I wore today? Green. Yeah. <laughs> I had to really dig through my closet to find something with green and gold. Nice, nice. Well, thank you again. And I, I think this is a wrap. And um, again, we just feel blessed that this was something we were able to pull off. We did it. You all did it. Thank you so much. And we will be in touch for when we can get together in person. And meanwhile, we do want to have the winning team stay on the Zoom session and Mohan just for a little bit of Q&A to wrap this final, the, the event up. But thank you very much. Um, it's been an amazing journey.